Okay, we're live. Okay. Well, welcome everyone. I'll call the general committee meeting to order. I hope everyone uh, around the table and at home is having a reasonable summer under the circumstances. Welcome to general committee of Barrie City Council. We are continuing to meet virtually for the time being. Of course, that is due to the distancing measures associated with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic members of council, executive management, the city clerk are participating tonight by video conference and the senior leadership team who have reports on tonight's agenda are available to answer any questions. Uh, we will run through the agenda as usual, we'll run through the consent agenda, reading the title associated with the recommended motions from the staff reports and the uh, items for discussion. Members of the general committee can ask that the item be held for further discussion. If the item's not held, the motion that's printed on the agenda is deemed to be approved on consent. There will be no further discussion at general committee, but please note recommendations from general tonight will be considered at city council immediately following this general committee meeting. So they will be considered tonight by council uh, for potential ratification uh, as tonight is a double meeting. So uh, we have no public meetings or presentations by staff members tonight. We do have an item of referred business. It was referred by motion 21G196 of the general committee report dated June 28th, uh, 2021. That is the suggestion to cancel, cancel uh, Canada Day. Uh, that is on the agenda. So we will deal with it immediately following the consent item. I don't need anyone to hold that. Uh, we do, however, under the consent agenda, have a number three staff reports and 10 items for discussion placed by members of council. So our consent agenda under staff reports, the first staff report has to do with the municipal names registry, adding some additional names. No holds on that item, it's approved. Uh, the next item I do need held, that's the appointments to the Arts Advisory Committee and the Council Comp Review Committee held by Council Reapna, thank you. Finally, we have a confidential plan and instructions related to an application to host the Canadian Men's Curling Championships, the Tim Horton Briar. Councilor Harvey, you wish to hold that? Okay. Uh, items for discussion, 8.1, quick start for affordable housing projects on institutional lands. It's placed by myself. Held by Councilor Morales. Uh, the next item is with regards to Redwood Park Community's grant applications to the CMHC. It's uh, to pass a resolution in support of those. No holds, that is approved. Uh, the next item for discussion, 8.3, is maintaining or cutting grass on municipal boulevards. Held by Councillor McCann. Uh, next, 8.4 is a letter of support for the Zero Emission Vehicle Awareness Initiative. No holds, that is approved. Uh, next, we have correspondence from the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit, SMDHU, for a line of credit, held by Councillor Kungle. Next item, 8.6, is the execution of facility use agreements for 29 Sperling Drive. No holds, that is approved, and that's that it continue to be used by the health unit for the purpose of immunization clinics. Uh, item 8.7 is an item uh, regarding overcoming the effects of colonization, discrimination, and racism on Indigenous communities in Canada. It's been placed by Deputy Mayor Ward. No holds. No. Councillor McCann, no. Okay. Uh, item 8.8 .8 is the requirement for hurricane straps on new builds. No holds. That is approved. Thank you, Councillor Natalie Harris for that item. Uh, item 8.9 is put on by Councillor Jim Harris and is with regards to an individual or single tree bylaw. No holds. That is approved. Just uh, uh, may, if I may interrupt, sorry, um, Your Worship. I wasn't sure if there was a successful hold or not on item number, um, sorry, on 8.7. Did that yes. get held by Councilor McCann? Yeah, that was held by Councilor McCann. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so 8.9, did anyone want to hold the tree bylaw? 
Yes, Council McCann, you do. Okay. Uh, finally, 8.10, painting pickleball lines on the tennis courts at Greenfield Park, also put on by Councilor Jim Harris. No holds on that one. It is approved. Okay. So we do have a number of items to talk about tonight. Uh, the first uh, issue though is the referred business. As I mentioned, that was referred by motion 21G196 on June 28th. That was the suggestion that came from the community forum regarding Canada Day. Councillor Aylwin, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, and since we are talking about uh, you know, the presence of indigenous people on this land, I do wanna take a second to acknowledge that most of us, if not all of us, are gathered on the land of the Anishinaabe, including the Odawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, who are collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy, and uh, that this land is also covered by the Williams Treaties of 1923. And that's, uh, that's important to recognize because this conversation has really uh, taken hold this year uh, in this country. And since the discovery of uh, hundreds and hundreds of children on the sites of former residential schools. Um, we've now, we now know that the number is as high as uh, 5,200 um, and still climbing. So there's a lot more work for us to do to work in that spirit of reconciliation um, with indigenous peoples, organizations and nations. Um, and so in the spirit of that work that needs to be done, um, Councillor Natalie Harris and I are moving a motion related to this item, uh, and I'll look to you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, is it okay for us to, to move it right now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, that's great. Thank you. So it is uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Natalie Harris, that, and this is paragraph one, that staff in the Recreation and Culture Department engage on an annual basis with partners such as Beausoleil First Nation, Brahma First Nation, Georgina Island First Nation, and other local First Nations, Métis, and Inuit peoples and organizations to explore and implement July 1st activities that include local oral histories and cultural celebrations, the history of residential schools, the 60 Scoop, the Millennial Scoop, and other educational elements as recommended, and two, that the general manager of community and corporate services and staff in the human resources department engage with local indigenous nations, peoples, and organizations on the implementation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's calls to action that fall under municipal responsibility, namely calls to action number 43, number 47, and number 57, and report back to general committee by the end of 2021. I can speak to that. Okay, uh, go ahead, Councillor Helen. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, so this is a two-part motion. Um, the first paragraph, as I said, is about July 1st activities and celebrations going forward. And to be clear, uh, this is not about canceling the celebrations of Canada Day. This is about adding context uh, and educational elements as the city did to great success um, this past July 1st. Um, it was really incredible to see the amount of people who came out to the Sacred Fire, um, who were learning about the history of colonization on this land and the ongoing impacts of colonization on this land. And so I think um, that's something that we can continue. Uh, our staff did such an excellent job this year engaging with uh, some local indigenous organizations. And I think that that work uh, could, uh, could continue in years uh, to come. The second paragraph is about our obligations under the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, that looked at the residential school system in Canada. And there are three calls to action that specifically name municipal governments, um, and they're 43, 47, and 57. So 43 um, calls upon all levels of government to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as the framework for reconciliation. Number 47 calls upon all levels of government to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over indigenous peoples and lands, uh, like the doctrine of discovery and terra nullius, and to reform the laws, policies, and litigation strategies that continue to rely on these concepts. And finally, number 57 calls on all levels of government to provide training, skills-based training in intercultural competency, conflict resolution, human rights, and anti-racism um, to all public servants. And so, uh, 
now is a good time to start this work. I think it's critical that we engage with local indigenous peoples, organizations and nations in this work um, and that we get the ball rolling, see how we can work together to make this a reality. Um, the heavy lifting of reconciliation um, does fall in the provincial and federal governments, but we also have a role to play uh, as the, the, the level of government closest to the ground. And so I'm hoping that we can pass this motion this evening and get the ball rolling on this important work. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Owen. Uh, is there anyone who wishes to speak to the motion on the floor? Councillor Thompson. Thanks, Mayor Lehman. Uh, maybe a question to either of the movers. Um, prior to this, have either of you reached out to our local indigenous leaders? Um, I just noticed that the uh, Friendship uh, Center was not named. So I was just wondering if you guys had reached out. Go ahead, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mary Lehman. And thank you for the question, Councillor Thompson. Yes, so um, I reached out um, several weeks back to the Very Native Friendship Center. Um, and definitely they are meant to be included within this motion. When when it says Indigenous organizations, um, that's, that's a category that would fall under for sure. So they're a key part of, of this engagement strategy going forward. Um, I reached out to them. I reached out to the, the chiefs of um, the Chippewa Tri Council, which is uh, Beausoleil First Nation, Rama First Nation, uh, and Georgina Island First Nation. Um, very preliminary discussions. I think because of um, the treaty obligation that we have on this land, I think this sort of engagement needs to be formalized um, and needs to be kind of taken up a level than just one counselor. But uh, they were the Barry Native Friendship Center was interested in the work. Their board of directors even provided some uh, generously provided some feedback uh, on on the motion, which I I really appreciate. Um, but this is just to get that work started of of truly engaging in a meaningful way. Yeah, great. Um, just a follow up um, with the new um, reconciliation day that has been um, brought forward by the Liberal government on September thirtieth. Was there any conversations that um, that a lot of the focus would be on that day, opposed to being on the July 1st with your consultation with the Native leaders? Uh, thank you for the question, Councillor Thompson. Um, that wasn't a topic of discussion. Um, I think the general sentiment from conversations I've had, and, and again, I, I don't think um, you'd find uh, every person would, would agree with this, but uh, that, Canada Day is a time where a lot of Indigenous people are reflecting on, on the impacts of colonization, um, both the history and the ongoing impacts. Um, and that up until this point, uh, Canada Day celebrations have been lacking some of that context in, in history. Um, and that's something that can be improved upon. I, I don't think uh, you can have too many days uh, in this country talking about those issues. Um, they're so critical to who we are. Uh, as a country that um, we need to be talking about it as much as possible and learning as much as we can. So um, I, I think the September 30th day of the, the National Day for Reconciliation is fantastic. And um, I think Canada Day uh, and adding that context would complement that perfectly. Yeah, and I couldn't agree. I, I think every day um, can be a day of uh, conversation and reconciliation. I was just, um, I just find sometimes it's nice to start the dialogue with our native leaders, but I just think we should leave it very open to what they want and not what we think they want. So that's pretty much where I just wanted to know that we reached out and it's just the motion looks a very structured motion and I would rather their input to um, that, but uh, I'll leave it there and uh, I appreciate your answers. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Thompson. Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, a comment more about paragraph two, where we start to look at some of those specifically named recommendations. And looking at number 57, um, where it does talk a bit about um, 
all levels of government taking on that approach to look at educating public servants. And I was wondering too, um, so maybe less of a question, but more of a comment, and, and I can ask this of staff, but I know the AMO conference is coming up next week. And wondering if AMO, as uh, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, um, whether or not they perhaps looked at an approach to look at training that all of us could be across Ontario, uh, you know, having access to, maybe it's something we can promote or advocate if we're at the conference, but I was wondering if staff might be able to include that in the information they come back with, uh, which may be, are there actions or activities of AMO that we could leverage um, that might be a toolkit or an educational uh, resource that would be consistent across all municipalities uh, where appropriate. Um, the other comment I had about um, bullet two was also, oh, I would love to see if those recommendations that come back around how we might take action under those specific um, ones in particular. But there's others that also talk a bit about um, language, uh, education, uh, healthcare and resources and recognizing Georgian College and some of the programming locally. Um, I'd love to understand if that can come back um, to general committee by the end of 2021, have we missed an opportunity to put a budget uh, into the intake forms for the next cycle where we might say, would we rest a certain amount of money to support activating some of these recommendations? So more of a comment, but a thought around, is the end of 2021 too far out? Would we miss an opportunity to actually consider a budget? Um, because it'd be really lovely if we could put aside either a grant or some type of funding to consider um, maybe responding to sponsoring someone locally uh, into some of these initiatives or supporting some of the programming locally. So a thought to consider, maybe it's a redirection of a question to staff to say, is that too late to consider an intake form? I'd love to see if there would be um, a budget consideration. Thanks, Councillor Congo. Are you specifically asking about um, the, the three that um, Councillor Aylwin mentions in his motion? Um, you know, the first one is a declaration by council on UNDRIP, which doesn't come with a cost. Uh, uh, 47 is the... Um, it's the legal pieces, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, the concepts that are rooted in colonialism. That no doubt would be work for our legal department, but probably isn't a community grant piece as much. Um, certainly, I would see the training as having a cost uh, through our organization, but one well worth uh, paying, and there are training budgets. Mm -hmm. I guess just to round out the, the question, and I will let uh, Ms. McAlpine answer around the, the training and uh, the cost of that and or you know a budget intake um, there are a couple of other projects underway in the community and i i don't know that they would necessarily come to city council for uh budget consideration for 2022 but there's certainly more that that come out of the trc recommendations too um don uh, on um, training Ms. McAlpine, uh and on the budget timing thank you mayor lehman through you to councillor kungal um, in speaking with our human resources department, I know they have been already researching training opportunities and uh, uh, are looking to identify the costs associated with those as well as um, the best opportunity for such training. In terms of the budget, um, we are proposing timing that would have the budget considered uh, by the end of the year. So uh, the timing of this wouldn't necessarily allow for an intake form to be part of the budget binder, but it may be something where we could, uh, it could be uh, considered by council as it considers the budget uh, staff report at that point in time. Thank you. And thank you for the, um, uh, the comment to Mayor Lehman, because in particular, I'm thinking about some of the broader areas that talk about, I think uh, recommendation 15 gets into languages. Um, 23 talks a bit about healthcare. And I think about the PSW programs at Georgian College, the language programs and indigenous um, programs. So um, maybe in general, it's a comment to say that when we are engaging with local indigenous nations, uh, populations in our local community, um, if there's any suggestions that come about, it would be great to incorporate those if they're beyond the scope of 43, 47, and 57 that touch on local opportunities to sponsor um, something that they see that would be meaningful 
um, and that would move in the direction of the broader recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Report. Okay, thanks, Councilor Congo. Agreed. Uh, Councilor Jim Harris. Right. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, yeah, I support um, the two um, paragraphs as presented. I just had a couple, uh, maybe an observation and, and possibly a suggestion. Um, I think Councillor Thompson raised a good point, and I, I did hear, and I was pleased to hear that Councillor Erwin mentioned that the Friendship Center was contacted. I would suggest um, maybe, and this is a friendly, but that they be named. I think respectfully, if we're naming a fairly wide range of organizations in this amendment, that it would be nice to name the Barry Native Friendship Center in this as well, and maybe the Barry Native Advisory Circle as well. Um, so, I mean, having the Barry organization's name would, would seem to be appropriate. Um, and my other comment would be um, on the predetermined items. I mean, I would, I was wondering that, you know, when we include um, certain items, we're not predetermining the consultation. So maybe as well, <clears throat> certainly, hopefully we get to the result that our Indigenous community is looking for uh, as far as uh, the uh, July 1st celebration. So maybe if um, in that, uh, if, if that would be agreeable, um, and I could do another amendment if it's not, it's too much for a friendly, but if we took out um, after celebrations, took out the items that are predetermined and just left, uh, we, it took out the history of residential schools, the 60 scoop and the millennial scoop and just included celebrate uh, oral histories, cultural celebrations and other educational elements as recommended by the indigenous community. So that way the, the full um, uh, complement of the, 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 uh, the um, activities, celebrations, whatever was included was born from those discussions, not predetermined by the amendment. So I don't know if you have any comments or thoughts on that. Maybe that can be for Councillor Thompson or Councillor Erwin. So maybe just procedurally, um, would the movers accept the first one as a friendly, uh, just to add the words, including the Barry Native Friendship Center and the, the advisory circle? Councillor Erwin? Uh, on that piece, um, I'm worried about leaving out other organizations because we haven't named a single organization in the motion so far. And that was kind of the intention was to leave it open. We named the Chippewa Tribe Council, the three local First Nations, um, but we haven't named any actual organization. So I'm, I, as long as we feel comfortable that those two covers it, I, I, I would hate for us to leave anyone out. Um, so uh, up to you, Councillor Harris, but, um, and I have some thoughts on the second suggestion as well. Okay. Yeah, I mean, really, um, if, if you think that's I just, and, and uh, maybe that's at least the comfort of having the Barry organizations specifically named, but, and I honestly don't know um, other than those two, and, I, and, I, and maybe there's others in your consultation that have been identified as potentials, but it, you know, if that would be acceptable to have them on there, that, that's really the question, I guess the central question, I don't know if that's Okay, so uh, Councillor Aylwin and Harris, uh, would you accept this as a friendly or would you prefer an amendment? I think Councillor Aylwin, you said no? Well, I, I mean, yeah, sure. Let's accept it as a friendly, sure. Great, sure. I'm in favor okay. of that. As well, I think it does. It would still say including, yes? Uh, yeah, okay. I, yeah, I don't want to limit. It sure. wouldn't limit it, yeah. Okay, Perfect. so if that's accepted as a friendly, then we will add the words uh, including Barry Native Friendship Center and the Barry Native Advisory Circle after organizations. Um, uh, so that would uh, it, leave it open to potential other organizations as well. And then the second one, Councillor Harris, you wanted to, um, you had a concern around the specific content. Um, were you looking for a comment from uh, the movers of the motion or did you wanna move it as an amendment? Um, yeah, I, I well, maybe first if it's if it's okay, Mayor Lehman, thank you for asking. Just to comment, I, I, I um, sure. I, th I think it's I understand the reason they're there, and I do appreciate um, those are key elements. I just uh, you know I, I like the idea of not predetermining any outcome before the consultation happens, and and they may very well jump to the front, and that's fine. And 
and just not predetermine any content was kind of my thought and leaving it open to the community to determine. So, that, so anyway, I'd be happy to hear because I, I do support the general these themes, this effort, um, this intention. So I just wanted that was one thought I had as far as detail. Okay, uh, Councillor Owen, and then I'll go to Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you. I 100% agree. This was not meant to be prescriptive. Uh, it was just listing examples. And this came from the grassroots effort led by an Indigenous uh, resident um, through the very user voice. Um, that's where the list came from. But um, I'm 100% open to a friendly amendment to remove that uh, because we don't want to dictate the terms of the engagement for sure. Councillor Natalie Harris, you okay with that as well? Did you want to make a comment? No, that's a great suggestion. That's great. Thanks. Okay, uh, so that change uh, would see us removing the, um, the specific uh, items uh, and uh, simply indicating that it, it would be through consultation uh, and local oral histories and, uh, and so forth. Uh, if that is understood, everyone understands the change there. Okay, uh, Councillor Jim Harris, I'll give you the floor back unless you're ready for us to move on. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'm, I'm ready to move on. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next, I have Councillor Gary Harvey. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm actually happy to see how this uh, motion has uh, moved along uh, quite quickly and uh, less prescriptive. Uh, but the reason I actually uh, wanted to speak was more to do with the training uh, that got brought up earlier. Uh, uh, one thing for staff to definitely look at would be the University of Alberta's uh, Indigenous Canada uh, program, which is a free online 12 week uh, program. Uh, the only charge would be if you want a uh, certificate. And I know myself because I did it a little over a year ago. It uh, is a very eye opening and engaging experience uh, to learn about uh, our uh, country's history, because uh, I personally had no idea that the uh, residential schools went on as long as 1996. So if uh, anyone around the table hasn't done it, I would also recommend uh, that you take the time to, uh, to complete it. Yeah, thanks, Councillor Harvey. I know a number of us have, and it is a really excellent, excellent resource. You can do it at your own pace and time, um, but it was eye-opening for me as well, and I appreciate, it. appreciate that recommendation. Uh, are there others who wish to comment on the motion? Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, I want to move a quick amendment here, um, and that would be that the uh, city ask uh, the Downtown Barry BIA to include Indigenous history and acknowledgement, um, um, acknowledgement education as part of any applications that they um, apply for uh, in regards to Canada Day funding to other levels of government, and I can speak to that. Okay, uh, so it would be an amendment, I think, to add a paragraph, uh, which would be that uh, City Council, I think, Council Morales, you're uh, looking for Council to request that the BIA include Indigenous history in applications for future Canada Day celebration funding. Is that correct? Council staff, whoever the appropriate um, entity. Yeah. Okay, uh, would you care to speak to that? Uh, yes, I think um, the symbolism uh, is important. I think, you know, <laughs> you know, the, a lot of people are obviously sensitive to, to the history, uh, unfortunately, that has happened before, but I think we can reinvent, not only just as a city, but as a country, we can reinvent Canada Day for everybody. And that includes Indigenous um, uh, indigenous uh, people whose, who, whose lands uh, this country uh, was founded on, uh, unfortunately, in questionable ways. Uh, we can really uh, move forward in, in a positive way. And I, what I like about this motion is it, it acknowledges a lot of that both in education and collaboration with, with stakeholders. Um, but I, I would hope that in the future, at least from my perspective, that Canada Day, the flag, the redness, the whiteness of it, isn't viewed as this um, controversial uh, thing with stigma. And that is why I think uh, moving forward, it's, and the reason it's the BIA, they're the ones that usually do the applications for the cake, for example, and for any other marketing materials when they're doing that application, it would be it would be really positive, I think, to include both the celebration of Canada as well as a lot of the things that have come out of this year, and that includes uh, you know the more orange and white colors and uh, the acknowledgement uh, for uh, Indigenous uh, children and 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 other situations like that. So this is really bringing it up top, and I think it'll strengthen any application uh, in the future and might actually get more money for the community and they're able to uh, celebrate, acknowledge, recognize Canada in a more wholesome and complete way. 
Okay, uh, thanks for that. The amendment on the floor is to add another paragraph uh, to uh, instruct the B or request that the BIA or staff uh, include Indigenous history in our applications for candidate funding. Uh, further discussion on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question on the amendment. Those in favor of the amendment, please indicate. Anyone opposed? None? That carries. Uh, thanks, Councilor Morales. Go ahead. Oh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I just got a quick other one. Um, that uh, that Barry, uh, Barry Fire and Emergency Services and Barry Police Services provide um, a memo to Council uh, by Q2 of 2022 about um, initiatives they can take to uh, increase um, applications from Indigenous members that, that identify from the Indigenous community. Okay, uh, so that would be another amendment to add a paragraph four. And that would be that Barry Fire and Barry Police report by memo by, uh, sorry, um, summer of next year. Q2. Uh, so of 2022, okay. Uh, on initiatives to increase applications from uh, Indigenous applicants. Um, on the amendment, go ahead, Councillor Morales. Um, pretty self-explanatory. I think uh, when we look at the, uh, the rank and file of those two departments, um, uh, Indigenous communities are represented a little bit less. I, um, obviously, both organizations have been making strides uh, to increase that diversity. I have seen it, um, you know, if anybody just looks at the couple of years, it's visible. And uh, a specific shout out to Barry Fire last year, their promotional videos were incredible in terms of uh, uh, women applying as well as minorities. Um, and even the way they marketed it, I know that staff marketed through chant, through cultural Facebook groups. I saw it pop up and places where it normally wouldn't be marketed. So I know they're already doing that, but if we're doing this motion and doing, trying to keep it broad, but uh, we want some specific action, I think it wouldn't hurt. And that's why I gave a very general range of Q2. So there's a three month kind of window there. Uh, and just a quick memo, it doesn't have to be a, a whole study on, on creative ways that they can uh, come back to us and, and see how they're, they're furthering, uh, I guess, our local impact on truth and reconciliation. Okay, uh, thanks, Councilor Morales. On the amendment, Councilor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I guess a question to, I guess it's Councilor Thompson sits on the police board. Um, but prior to me asking that question, uh, Ms. Ms. Cook, um, am I allowed to discuss anything to do with relation to um, City of Barrie Police? Because that is usually a um, conflict for me. Uh, Ms. Clerk? Ms. Clark, Ms. Cook. Hey, Clerk, um, Ms. Cook. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mary Lehman. Um, through you to Councillor Natalie Harris. Um, that would have been a question for the Integrity Commissioner okay. um, with respect to um, that question because she's the one that's previously provided you advice and guidance. And unfortunately, I cannot provide you advice or guidance in that respect. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, I'm not sure. You, you'll have to proceed okay. as you see fit. Okay. Natalie, to clarify, it's about future recruitment. So unless you are, unless uh, a family member or something like that is going to be applying per se, I don't, the intent of my amendment, I'm just trying to clarify through you, Mayor mm -hmm. Lehman, is future recruitment. It does not include uh, promotion, demotion, or current active personnel. Thanks, Councilor Morales. Councilor Harris? I'd like to actually hear what Councillor Thompson says. That would be great if that's okay first. <laughs> okay, so that's, uh, you were asking Councillor Thompson about? I, I'm, I'm thinking he might have some input for me to help clarify whether or not I should vote or not. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, that one um, is ultimately uh, up to you, but go ahead, Councillor Thompson. Yeah, I, uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, I won't have advice whether you should vote or not. Um, I would hate to put you in this, any kind of jeopardy. Um, I just wanted to say to the mover of the amendment that uh, Barry Police is actually undertaking a systemic review. And uh, this is something we already discussed at the board, mm -hmm. how to engage with um, a wide variety of um, cultures and everything to try to increase the diversity of the police force and maybe just as a friendly, but uh, if you're adding Barry police and fire, um, I think we should have the corporation we all represent as well, <laughs> instead of uh, leaving that out. So that's, uh, I don't know if that information was close to what you're looking for. 
Councilor Harris, but uh, Barry Police is very actively looking uh, at this. Um, I can't speak for fire. Okay, Councilor Natalie Harris. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so I will um, remove myself from this portion of this vote for this amendment uh, just to be safe, but um, I'm happy to hear those responses and thank you for that. Okay, and what we can do, uh, Councillor Harris, is separate out paragraph four and vote on it separately so you have an opportunity to vote and comment on the first three paragraphs again uh, before we, we finalize that. Um, so this would be um, a new paragraph four. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, Madam Clerk, is Councillor Natalie Harris's potential interest been recorded? Yes, Mayor Lehman, it has. Thank you very much. On uh, the new potential paragraph four, the amendment, uh, those who wish to comment, Councillor Aylwin. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, I'm feeling a little bit reluctant to support this um, just because uh, in the spirit of what we've been speaking about, not being too prescriptive, um, I'm just not sure if this is something that Indigenous people uh, are asking for. It's not part of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So um, I'm not sure if Councillor Morales, you have some additional information for me about where um, the thought behind this came from. I'm interested to hear um, if there was engagement or if there's an opportunity to do so going forward. Good. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Councillor Morales? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Alwyn. Well, I'll give you this context. When you visit uh, the fire halls in uh, Barry Fire, um, I made, uh, historically, there was two women, one African Canadian, I believe one person of Latino descent, and that's it. And we're talking 138 plus firefighters. Um, I believe uh, there was one more woman that was hired in the last recruit class. I may be missing maybe something else, but those numbers don't reflect the community. And just the way other municipalities have been making efforts to making sure their employees reflect, uh, you know, the faces uh, of the community they represent and the work that uh, I know Councillor Harvey uh, had been doing in the background uh, last year uh, further to that. I think it is an appropriate timing. I, 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 uh, I think... Um, whether it's, uh, again, in, in Indigenous voices are, are sometimes not highlighted enough in terms of let's make initiatives for minorities. And the fact that you're bringing this forward is just a great time to put a little teeth. It's not limiting. Um, if the departments feel like they, for example, as Councillor Tom Thompson said, if the Barry Police just wants to say, this is already part of a holistic review uh, in their memo and it will the memo will be released prior to your request or after your request, then that's all they put in the memo, that's it. Case closed, one hour submission, and they're done. But if, for example, if Barry Fire, who had really been focusing on women recruitment and minority, if for some reason uh, their uptake from Indigenous communities wasn't as much in the previous hiring cycle, I know they're going to skip one year, likely. So now this might be a, a, a good kind of catalyst. So I don't see a drawback. And my that's why I said memo. And I kept it. I gave a three, a 90 day kind of window. Um, so it wouldn't be too cumbersome. Thanks for that response. Okay, uh, Councillor Harvey, go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I'm actually happy to see uh, this amendment come forward too. And uh, I think Councillor Thompson brought up a good uh, note here that uh, uh, we should be including the corporation of the city of Barrie in, in this also. Uh, and uh, we have to make sure that all of our public institutions here in the city are representative of the community that uh, that we serve. So I don't know if Councillor Morales will take that as a friendly to add that in or? Okay, uh, I think uh, we give him the thumbs up. So um, we would replace, I think, Barry Fire with the corporation in the city of Barry since Barry Fire is part of the corporation. Uh, so that would request that the police service provide a, a response as well as a corporate response. Uh, are there further comments on the amendment? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the new paragraph four, please indicate. Are any opposed? None. That carries by those voting. Councilor Morales. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. And then my other one uh, amendment would be uh, to remove, um, give me one second here, I wanna get this right. Uh, to remove uh, section so in, in number two, paragraph two, uh, to, remove, to remove reference to the call of action um, number 47. And I can speak to that. Okay, uh, so the amendment is to remove reference to number 47, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. So the reason I'm removing uh, this recommendation, it's um, 
it, it's 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 too vague to me, members of council. So I'm just going to read it. Uh, Councillor Alwyn, thank you for uh, providing the document and highlighting that. We call upon federal, provincial, territorial, and municipal governments to repudiate concepts used to justify European sovereignty over Indigenous peoples and lands, such as the doctrine of discovery and terra uh, nullius, and to reform those laws, government policies, and litigation strategies that continue to rely uh, on such concepts. So the reason I'm removing this is that is very vague, very powerful language about basically any on any government policy that we have, whether it be to land use planning, purchasing, uh, expropriation, uh, uh, construction, programming. Uh, this it, it's it's it, it's way too vague for my liking. I would be comfortable waiting for the federal government, whatever that government may be, if they can provide clarities to the provinces or the provinces to the municipalities, since we are a creature of the province, as to basically, hey, be more specific about 47. What do you mean by this? Because the way it's worded, and I hope members of council are looking at it, reform those laws, government policies, litigation strategies that continue to rely on those concepts. And then it's referencing, you could basically do a master's thesis on, on two of those catchphrases there. Um, I would have, have concern as to how it would affect our uh, policies, how it would affect our new upcoming official plan. Um, you know, even with uh, previous secondary pl plans and, and, and park place, like how long were we in mediation with those applicants? Um, so this, I just don't want to open up a door that maybe we're not ready to handle without the direction of the federal uh, and provincial government. Um, and as you, as members of council know, and the community knows for the last um, just under a decade, um, I wouldn't want to uh, adopt this without having, and I don't just want direction from our legal department. I want interpretation from the federal government and the provincial government, especially when we have the train station and all the work that uh, Mayor Lehman and staff have done over, again, just under a decade of work. And again, how cooperative, um, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the Indigenous group ha has been with the city. So I just want to take a pause on this one. Um, I would say to ask the federal government to provide clarity, but I think this needs to come from a top, uh, a, a top-down approach just for this amendment, which is why I left the other ones. Okay, uh, thanks, Councillor Morales. Uh, I think I saw Councillor Thompson. Did I see you? Thanks, Mayor Lehman. Um, it was more of a point of clarity, I, I thought, but it was paragraph one that the items were removed. It wasn't paragraph two, so I apologize. Uh, I was just. Uh, I thought we had already removed, but it was in paragraph one. Okay, uh, comments on the proposed amendment. Councilor Rowan. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I won't be supporting the amendment um, for two reasons. The first uh, is that number 47, the recommendation number 47 from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was through like thousands and thousands of hours of work with residential school survivors, uh, legal scholars, Justice Marie Sinclair uh, and others. And um, I think they've recommended that that be a call to action for municipal governments for a reason. Uh, and the second reason is because this, emo this motion is to ask that our staff report back on what it would take to implement uh, these calls to action. So um, I'm hoping that our legal department can take a look at this. If it's um, opening up a whole legal can of worms that we can't uh, open right now, then um, I'm sure they would recommend that we uh, engage with the federal government or wait and see what approach we should take. But I'm interested to hear actually what they, they find from that cursor review. So I won't be supporting it at this time. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Councillor Owen. Councillor Ripma. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I don't think I'm going to support this uh, amendment either. Um, and the reason for that is, is that we're asking our staff to engage with uh, our Indigenous communities around these issues and around these um, uh, requirements uh, that uh, have been put out. And so um, I don't think we should be cutting one off and saying, oh, we're not dealing with that one. Um, I think uh, we really ought to uh, engage with our local community. I do agree with Councillor Morales that um, uh, this is a bigger topic than the city of Barrie. This is a topic that we will no doubt involve uh, the, the feds and, and the province, but I don't think we should just eliminate it um, uh, just because 
of some concerns. I, I think uh, we're a long ways from dealing with uh, details. I think it's now time to sort of start it, start the engagement and uh, let's see what it what it means. Um, and um, we certainly won't be doing that in isolation, I'm sure. Uh, we'll be dealing uh, with other municipalities, the federal government and the province. Thanks, Councillor Ripma. Uh, Councillor Morales. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. From the discussion, thank you, uh, Councillor Ritma. I appreciate your, your, your comments on that. Um, to the movers of the motion, so Councillor Alwyn, Councillor Harris. So the wording goes that general manager community City of Barrie uh, engage with local um, on the implementation calls to action that fall under namely number 43, 47, 48. How do we implement something we can't define? So I can't define it right now. So I guess I'll ask it as a question. Councillor Alwyn, Councillor Harris, can you define for me um, 47? Um, I obviously, it, it, it's a complex subject, but can you define it beyond a very generic paragraph that is in the PDF that we got? Because I, as a member of council, how can I vote in favor of engaging those those uh, uh, those you know uh, communities or organizations to implement an item number of a recommendation that is unclear? So if 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 if, if you guys can define what essentially forty seven is a little bit more specifically. And I would have no problem. So it's not a lack of willingness. It's, it's just the fact that it's, it's a very cloudy general recommendation that could have significant um, legal implications specifically to land to almost every aspect of city operations. Uh, Councilor Allen, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I'm no legal scholar, um, which is why I think our, our uh, our staff should should look at this uh, in consultation with local indigenous nations and organizations. Um, but the concept of terra nullius is about um, the idea that this land was empty um, when Europeans first landed here. And that because it was empty, uh, they could claim it for themselves. And that's the doctrine of discovery. That's my basic understanding of what that means, um, which of course, you know, that it, it was a lie. The land wasn't empty here. Um, there were people already here when Europeans first made contact. So that's my basic understanding. But uh, again, I'm hoping that we can um, fully understand the implications of number 47 with the report back from our staff. Okay, thank you, Councillor Alwyn. Mayor Lehman, uh, based on the feedback from Councillor Alwyn, I have even more concerns um, that uh, that could basically bring into question the, the, the reality of, of, of property rights, property law. Now, I get it. This is a very frustrating conversation. Uh, some people are more personal and close to it. Um, um, so I, I'm not trying to diminish that. In a very different situation, as some of you may know, like I was born in Colombia. I don't think I literally named after Christopher Columbus. Um, and, you know, basically most of the country is mixed in one way or another. A uh, comparable way would be to say Métis here in Canada. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't come from a place of ignorance on this. So I would, Mayor Lehman, if I can't for you, I would amend my amendment, not to exclude number 47, but I think this word does matter. So I would leave it as printed in the email. I would take up 47 and I would just do a separate, uh, separate line that says that the GM of Community Corporate Services and Staff in the HR Department um, consult with the in local indigenous nations, peoples, organizations and the federal government or the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission or group, I don't know what the proper terminology would be, um, on, on the specifics of number 47. So a new line, so I would remove number 47, a new line, I would say that, that the city of Barrie essentially as a catch-all for that, those first three lines, uh, that the city of Barrie uh, consult with those on defining 47. And it's an important distinction because as it stands, the city of Barrie's direction is to consult those organizations to implement them. Basically saying, we're on board, let's see how we can implement them and we're gonna let the council know and they can decide. But I really wanna distinguish numbers 47 is to consult to what it means um, and what the ask is. Uh, I don't feel comfortable with uh, lumping that one in with um, directing staff to, hey, how can we implement it more? Hey, can, how can we get more information on what this means? And that's based on the feedback, the good feedback I've gotten from um, the members of council. Okay, uh, Council Morales, I recognize you wanna change your amendment uh, and thanks for that language. I guess the question I would ask 
ask you is you, you seem to have concerns that uh, this TRC recommendation um, has a very broad impact. Can you tell us, what are you basing those concerns on? Do you, can you give us some, has there been some analysis or some backlash or some, uh, is there a source you can give us that identifies that concern? Absolutely, thank you, Mary Lehman. I think that the, I think the concerns are founded on the lack of clarity of what it means. So if the, if, the, if, if the motion from the mover had been that council supports those items, so we want to reach out to the people that were part of the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Committee uh, group, um, as well as the federal government to get feedback on how to implement them at a municipal level with the score of the province, I would have got, let this, I would have let this go without any questions. But the wording is to consult these local groups on the implementation of those. So at that point, I'm looking at those specific points. And again, thank you, Councilor Alwyn, for, for providing PDF. I am looking uh, at that as our action items. And the moment I looked at 47 and that action item was extremely vague with extremely powerful language that once again, you could write entire master thesis on without clarity on the execution of those, then it gives me pause to con uh, for concern. At first, I tried to remove it. Thank you, Councilor Rima, for your uh, clarity of language uh, and your intent. I'm on board, I agree. So I'm now trying to find the, uh, the reasonable middle, which is let's not take it off the table and let's still be leaders municipally, but I need clarity on number 47. There's entire, um, uh, um, there's entire areas of study and property law and contract law and uh, restitution that could become very problematic for, for not only property laws, but our planning policy and things of that nature. So I think it would be, um, a little bit too fast to include 47 in, hey, let's see how we can implement this. That's why my, my revised amendment is, let's see how we can implement the other two, but let's see, how, let's see what number 47 really means. And that is consulting with the same authority figures um, that Councillor Alwyn had in the motion and including the federal level of government if they can provide clarity on what they really mean. And the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, I'm sure would be happy to provide clarity if they're not currently active still as an entity. I'm sure they can point us to a federal government resource and proper scholars that could give us clarity. And then if, if, if the answer is that it, it's a comfortable, reasonable um, recommendation, then so be it. Okay, so uh, given the amount on our agenda and so on, I do want to move the discussion towards a vote. Uh, but Councillor Morales, just to be clear, the, the question I'm asking you is, you have a very broad interpretation of this that says it would it potentially upends planning law and so forth. Uh, can you point us to a source that indicates that's what would happen if uh, TRC 47 was implemented in Canada? Um, thank you, Mary Lehman. I think uh, a very close source to us right there would be just the move or the motion. The fact that it has, it has potential to implications, not necessarily upend, but it has the possibility because one of the, the, one of the language, the words in number 47 is the concept of, um, uh, let me just, I'm scrolling up to it, the concept of uh, uh, Doctrine of Discovery and Terra Nullius. So the fact that, again, land was free and it was just here to claim. So that can have some serious implications in terms of uh, uh, restitution um, and, 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 and essentially property laws. Again, I am not a legal scholar by any means, but even, even uh, South Africa went through very complicated issues such as this. So before lumping that in a paragraph with implement these recommendations, I just wanna take a pause still moving forward and just wanting to get clarity on how and how the execution of carrying out number 47 would look like. Okay. I think that's but about. I, I, to be very clear about my question, this is your interpretation. This is my interpretation okay. uh, specifically on the, even on the clarification of the mover of the motion and uh, unless the move of the motion or the seconder can provide more, uh, a more uh, uh, fleshed out plan on what number 47 specifically means, um, then th that's, that, that's a, that's a reasonable concern. Okay, uh, Councillor Natalie Harris, then Councillor Aylwin. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I just was wondering, uh, I'm not sure if we can, but if there's some, a staff member in the planning department that could maybe speak to this point a little bit and see if, is there concern that comes from the department with respect to the laws that we have, um, if this goes forward? I, I didn't think it would be a problem, um, but, those are the professionals with respect to that. Is there anybody that could help, Andrea? Thank you. Ms. Miller? 
Thank you for the question, uh, Councillor Harris. Through you, Mayor Lehman, uh, at this point in time, we don't have any concerns, but I think as the motion is indicated, it is a report back. And uh, certainly we would explore that uh, in detail and report back to you if there was something that came to our attention. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks, uh, Councillor Owen, anything to add? Uh, I just completely agree. I think we may be splitting hairs here uh, because I think the intention here is to learn about potential implications of implementing number 47. So I think we're actually on the, the same page, Councilor Morales, uh, slightly different wording maybe, but I think we're all paddling in the same direction here and wanting to understand the full implications of those calls to action. Okay, I'd like to move to calling the question on this amendment. Um, are there any, is there any other comment? Okay, uh, those in favor of the amendment, please indicate. Opposed? I'm opposed as well, the amendment's defeated. Uh, on the main motion, are, as amended several times, both friendly and by vote, are there further comments? Okay, we'll do this separately. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Councillor Thompson. Or were you getting ready to vote? Okay, uh, we will do this separately uh, to allow Councillor uh, uh, Natalie Harris to uh, not participate in the vote uh, on number four or number three, Madam Clerk? I have lost track. Um, it would be number four, Mayor Lehman. Um, okay. As well as, I just had a quick quick question of clarification. I was trying to mm -hmm. get your attention. Um, I just wanted to ask about the July 1st. Is that been removed or is that still in the motion, the date? Because we took out the specifics. No, that wasn't removed. Yep. Okay, so on paragraphs one to three of the motion, members of general committee, I'll call the question. Those in favor of paragraphs one to three of the motion, please indicate. None opposed, that carries unanimously. Uh, on paragraph four, Councillor Natalie Harris has previously declared her conflict and I see she's turned her camera off. Madam Clerk, does she, she doesn't need to declare again or does she? No, Mayor Lehman. Okay, thank you. Uh, I will call the question on paragraph four. Are those in favor of paragraph four? Again, unanimous uh, by those voting. Thank you, members of general committee. Uh, that completes the referred business item. We can now get into the items that were held. Uh, the first staff report that was held, uh, actually both staff reports that were held are confidential. So we'll actually do that uh, at the conclusion of the general committee meeting. So we can move now to the items for discussion, all of which were public tonight. Uh, the first one that was held uh, was placed by myself. That's the quick start for affordable housing projects on institutional lands. And Councillor Morales, you held that item. Uh, yes, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I want to start off by uh, commending, uh, this is an incredible item for discussion and uh, you, you, need to, you need to get that acknowledgement. The reality is Barry um, has a lot of really valuable land in what people call Old Barry. Um, that is kind of not landlocked, but there's institutions, whether they are community groups or places of worship. So uh, could be churches or places of worship, or it could be not that, um, where the land is valuable, the building is maybe kind of old and they're kind of just, you know, repairing it as they go they're, And they're kind of just not really thinking of, of moving or, or doing something else. Uh, and they're there. So I think this is a, a really good initiative. This, it, you know, um, gets people, it gets those community groups in the mindset of thinking what the value of their land is in a productive way that gives back to the community uh, and meets our strategic uh, plan goals of providing more just attainable housing, affordable housing, basically for the right for people to live and bury uh, if, if they want to and not be forced out of our community. Um, and this is a really creative way of doing that. Um, you know, if, if anybody, you know, if the market, if, if, if people were rushing for a planning department um, to get an idea of what their land could do for the community, we wouldn't be needing this. But the reality is they're in the business of being a place of worship or being an institution. And so I think this is a really good encouragement. That said, I am gonna move a small amendment to this. Um, and the amendment uh, basically just reads that staff also uh, uh, come back to council uh, with a scope of other ways that we could incentivize these institutions to providing um, housing. Um, and that, include, uh, and that includes, um, and kind of in brackets, I'm saying, and that includes um, a discounting of uh, development charges, partial or complete, um, additional application fees, comma, and other ways. Um, and 
I can speak to that, Marilyn. Sorry, uh, Councilor Morales is moving an amendment. It's a new paragraph three uh, that would have staff report back on potential additional financial incentives uh, to support these types of development. Uh, and I believe you referenced including potentially um, reducing or waiving development charges and application fees. Go ahead, Councilor Morales. Perfect, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'm gonna, for the purpose of the explanation of this, I'm just going to use a place of worship. Uh, it could be not just that, but a place of worship, again, they're not developers. They're not in the business of, of building or, or looking at land values and being strategic. They're in business of being a place of worship. So if Mayor Lehman's item for discussion goes through and comes back and there's uptake, right? That institution gets the call from our, our staff and they go, you know what? Yeah, let's, let's, do a, let's do a block plan. Let's see what we could do with all that parking that's barely used except on Christmas and New Year's Eve. Um, and then they like it to go, wow, look at all, look at all the senior housing we could do. Look at all, all the gear to rent to gear income housing we can do. Look at all the, you know, fill in the blank housing we could do here. Um, their lands would, uh, the, the probability that the lands would actually be developed with the appropriate partner through the tendering process described in the area for discussion go up significantly if there's other incentives on the table, uh, such as uh, more discounts for the application process or, or DCs as well. And the reason I, I, again, I wanna know, staff is gonna tell us the implication of uh, reducing DCs uh, partially or fully and other also other ways that maybe we didn't think of. Um, but just to give people a level of comfort, we're not talking about reducing C's, uh, DCs on lands that we were expecting to come onto the system. We're talking about lands that we, for the most part, just expected to become state parking lots for a generation or two. Like nobody expected, and I, I don't want to single out one place of worship specifically, but no one expected that that church was going to get an application to, you know, get 200 units of se uh, senior housing or uh, supportive housing. Um, so those DCs were never kind of accounted for in our in our in our in our finances. So it shouldn't intuitively hurt us. However, I'm not the finance department. I want them to tell us uh, that. Um, um, and the, the, also the property taxes that we would be getting on an ongoing basis from those units coming onto the system would actually be rent re revenue positive significantly while meeting, while housing people um, in, in ways that we much need. Um, and then I think closing to this amendment, uh, one great example of that is that I believe it's, there's a specific church, I don't wanna get the name wrong, that, own, that owns at least a, a piece of land between the IOF on Dean Avenue in my ward and the Barry uh, Painswick Library. And they kind of sat on it. And way before I came on the council, they were like, maybe we build a church. Maybe we build a church with some seniors housing the way St. Mary's did in Ward 1 decades ago. That's extremely successful, by the way. And they never really kind of decided what to do. Uh, corporate in Toronto was just kind of leaving it. And eventually they went, you know what? We are good in terms of places of worship. We're just not the right partner. And they put it to the market. It got sold by a local brokerage. It got picked up by a KW uh, investor. And it's rezoned to be one of one of the most significant purpose-built rental buildings out of cement too, not just wood frame um, in the city. Uh, it, now, the, there's still some engineering work being done, but in a couple of years, that is significant inventory for all levels of uh, income. So that's one small example about how uh, I think this amendment uh, and even incentivizing with a possibility, not the guarantee, but the possibility of further other discounts in application fees or uh, in the DCs themselves uh, is exactly the kind of catalyst that we need. Okay, uh, thanks Councilor Morales on the amendment. Councilor McCann. Sorry, Mayor Lehman, I wanted to talk on the main motion, sorry for that. Okay, no problem. Uh, Councilor Natalie Harris, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, yeah, I think it's a, a great suggestion. I'm in favor of this, if we can broaden what incentives are available and have that discussion. And again, it's just a discussion and coming back and then going forward, I think it's wonderful. And yes, kudos to you, Mayor Lehman. I think it's a great suggestion, great idea. Um, wish you'd thought about it sooner, but <laughs> it's really good, so thanks. <laughs> thanks, Councillor Harris. Uh, Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Your Worship. A uh, question for staff, probably Ms. Miller would be the best. Uh, I'm just uh, a little confused. It sounds like uh, Councillor Morales's uh, 
motion is very similar to what we already have in our CIPs. Um, just wondering if you can provide uh, some further clarification on that. Thank you for the question, Councillor Harvey. Through you, Mayor Lehman, um, you are correct. Um, the suggestions that you've asked uh, staff to report back on um, are already in place. Um, all fees for affordable housing and a number of other incentives, incentives are already available um, for, uh, for affordable housing units. Uh, so we will be able to do a simple report back. Great, thank you. I'm, I'm not quite sure that we even need this amendment then if uh, we're already doing this. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll leave that as a question to the mover of the motion. Sure, uh, Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Harvey. No, I, it's a fair question. Um, Ms. Miller, if, if, if you may know, or Ms. Um, Ms. Banfield, um, do you know how many places of worship since our CIP has been at least even talked about? I won't say implemented or, clear or ratified. Have any inquiries or serious inquiries we've gotten from places of worship about them possibly um, utilizing their land to build housing of any type? Ms. Miller. Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councilor Morales, I don't have the exact number, but um, several have um, been um, been brought to our attention and we are currently working on um, a few of those right now. Amazing. So the fact that, uh, so to answer your question, Councilor Harvey, most of these plans are about marketability. So while we currently have a really good CIP uh, that has different uh, you know, criteria that people could qualify, um, one of the limiting factors that we've heard in discussions is the fact that you know, the CIP can only be as big as council is willing to fund it. And I remember, remember, I remember some amendments of in the budget, should we add a couple million, should we take it away? Um, I think even putting in this motion empowers our staff, probably in Vestbury, but I don't know who's making those calls to go, hey, because Mayor Lehman's motion literally says for them to be contacted, hi there, uh, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, um, this is a possibility. We'd be covering uh, the architect or the block, uh, have you drawn out a block plan? And council is also considering um, a partial or full discounting of DCs. Um, I want to see what that looks like. Uh, in the CIP, I think there's some really good incentives, um, but I, again, and, and, and I might need clarity on that, but I don't know if they go full, they, they are reduced all the way down to zero. Um, so I really just want to, you know, uh, Councilor McCann's always telling us about sales and marketing. I really want to empower our invest Barry staff when they pick up that phone to say, you know, Barry is the best place uh, to do business and increase housing and address the fact that people in Barry are not able to live in Barry who grew up here. And I'm going to, and we're going to tell you how that's going to work. That's going to work with uh, covering soft costs to, to, to uh, uh, build out a block plan and also uh, possibly incentivize you even more with DCs. Um, and I don't think we're adding unnecessary work. And if it even gets one institution who wouldn't have otherwise approached us because um, Mayor Lehman's motion was in, in link with a CIP from a couple months or a year plus, um, then that's a net positive for the city. Um, I'll just go to Ms. Miller uh, to respond to that uh, with regards to the um, uh, the existing incentives and whether they take those fees and charges to zero. Thank you for the question, Mayor Lehman. In terms of all of the fees, um, definitely do, do take them down. The, the issue would be with respect to the additional grants. Um, and so the development charges or, or other elements um, that depends on how much is, is funded in the, um, um, in the CIP from council. And you have the ability to make that decision at every, um, uh, at every budget cycle. I also have to remind council that um, you know, we need to have um, DCs collected in other areas in order to be able to, um, to, to do some of the, that granting. So um, there is the ability to give all of the fees uh, and other um, incentives uh, related to affordable housing, but the DC component does uh, tie back to the grant money that is available uh, decided by council. Okay, thank you. Councillor Harvey? Actually, that's fine, Your Worship. Uh, I was going to actually uh, get a little more clarification from Ms. Miller. Uh, I, I still think it's quite redundant what we're uh, what this motion is asking, but uh, I'll see what the, the rest of them around the table have to say. Okay, I'll take a few more comments, and then I do want to bring the amendment to a vote. Uh, Deputy Mayor Warge. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. I might have a question. Can I just get uh, Councillor Morales to read the amendment again? Sure. Uh, thank you, Deputy Mayor Warge. Through you, Mayor Lehman, uh, and add a paragraph. Uh, that staff, um, uh, 
excuse me, I'm uh, hitting a little battery, that staff prepare a memo uh, and come back to uh, council on the implications of uh, reducing application costs, uh, including uh, uh, reduction of DCs, uh, partially or fully, and other ways of reducing uh, application or soft costs for the institutions if they are to be accepted as an applicant under the, the program proposed. So it includes both DCs and then other avenues uh, and ways. And that's for both the totality of costs and cash flow. Because sometimes it's not that sometimes deferrals are nice, but cash flow upfront is also um, sometimes goes into a, a development um, consideration. Okay, Councilor Morales, I'm just going to get you to read the exact language of the amendment again. <laughs> that staff investigate the implications of uh, reducing uh, DCs or eliminating DCs. Uh, as well as the implication of other of, of providing other uh, incentives for applicants in regards to soft costs. Okay, Deputy Mayor Work. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe it's a question both for you and Councilor Morales. And I don't have any problem with the motion, but I'm wondering what would happen with. Um, I have at least two churches in my ward that have quite a bit of property that aren't institutional zoning. They're actually uh, residential zoning, which makes it easier for them to build a zone, to build it because they don't have to go through the hoops that are rezoning, but they would be on it. They would not be eligible for either the funding study or if Councilor Morales' motion adds anything, they would not be eligible for that. And one of them is the Salvation Army, which definitely has plans to put more housing on their property on Lillian, but it's owned residential. So would they be outside looking in? Thanks for that, Deputy Mayor Ward. Um, and it's funny because uh, I was actually going to ask you to take the floor so that I could move an amendment to allow places of worship under other designations to also um, participate. Uh, I think our staff should reach out to them uh, and I think they should be eligible. So I was actually going to ask all of you to support that next. <laughs> okay, do you want me to take the chair? Oh, well, let's deal with this one first. Okay. Thank yeah, you. so let's just deal with uh, Councillor Morales' amendment on the floor to uh, look at additional financial incentives. Are there further comments on the amendment that's on the floor? Okay, seeing none. Oh, Councillor McCann, did you wish to comment? A quick question again. Sorry, uh, we're just asking staff to investigate. We're not actually implementing, right? With this amendment? Correct. Yeah. Correct. Okay, uh, on the amendment, I'll call the question. Those in favor? And opposed? Okay, that does carry. Uh, on the main motion, I'll go back to Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mayor uh, Lehman. And uh, I got to agree with uh, Natalie Harris. Uh, this should this is a great uh, item discussion, and uh, it's uh, thoughtful, it's creative, and uh, uh, yeah, I should have done it earlier. So I'm fully supportive of it. And um, I maybe have a few questions that maybe I would ask during the week, but obviously we got city council right after, so maybe I'll just ask some clarification, clarification, clarif clarification questions, and maybe uh, throw some Hail Marys and see if. Uh, Mayor Lehman, you think that they may be a good uh, friendly onto your amendment, okay? Okay. So, uh, you know, there's a, a great saying that you don't know what you don't know. And I think it's really uh, proactive that we're actually having an aggressive, um, proactive approach going up to these uh, churches, going up to these buildings and saying, hey, have you ever thought of this? Because sometimes people get in their, their rails and they just do their day to day and they're not thinking creative, for creative reasons that can help themselves or the community. So that's why I'm, I'm totally supportive of it. Um, but I'm wondering if we should put in a bit of a fail safe uh, just because we're looking to spend $200,000. So I'm guessing that's going to be $10,000 a report. And uh, there may be, you know, hopefully not, uh, hopefully they'd be anomalies, but there may be some institutes that just take the uh, incentive with no real interest in actually building subsidized or uh, transitional homes and just want to increase their property values, right? So I thought that I don't have an I don't have the number in mind. Uh, let's call it two years. Let's call it five years. I definitely would be open for discussion that if a uh, permit is not pulled within five years, that we would uh, request that ten thousand dollars back. Or also, if they sold their property without pulling a permit, we request that ten thousand dollars back. I know it's not a lot of money, and I'm, and I'm and I would be open for the debate that this may create more minutia, which is not what I want to do, but I would just like to get your thoughts, Mayor Lehman, anybody else, any thoughts 
if they think that having that little small line in the contract just to protect that two hundred thousand dollars from um, uh, from our residents. Sure. Thanks, Councilor McCann. Um, so I guess the first part I wouldn't support. The second part, uh, I think we could ask for an undertaking. So uh, I think the first part of what you said was uh, that if they don't pull a building permit, I think a lot of uh, places of worship, uh, service clubs, other institutional owners would be reluctant uh, to pursue uh, the study. So it would kind of defeat the purpose. I mean, if you, it, the whole point of the study is to see whether it is feasible. And so, you know, I'm always a believer that, uh, you know, I think the, the the purpose of this grant is to allow organizations, as Councillor Morales referenced, who don't have that capacity to understand what's possible, what the art of the possible would be, uh, but also the implications. So they can take it to their governing body or their own uh, elder council, whatever it might be, uh, and, um, and make an informed decision. On the second part, um, you know, the risk of somebody doing the study and then using it to augment their value uh, when they sell it. Um, I could see that happening. I'd be disappointed and I'd be surprised if uh, any of these organizations uh, tried to sort of take advantage of it in that way. Um, I also suspect I don't, you know, we probably would have some difficulty uh, creating a legal recovery for that. Um, but I do think we could request that the organization sign an undertaking that says it's not for the purpose of selling the land. Um, however, the big asterisk I would put on that is what if they want to sell the land to an affordable housing developer? I mean, that's kind of the whole point. So um, while I don't think my intent with the motion anyway, and I, you know, I guess I'm open to it, but my intent with the motion was uh, more for the organizations which continued to operate but have a big chunk of land to do what's been done by several of them already. Some of our best places to live, particularly for seniors in Barrie, are on uh, places of worship properties. I think of St. Mary's, I think of Collier Place, I think of others. Um, but, you know, in, in some cases, there may be a transaction required for some of that land. So I guess long way of saying, I don't think I'd support that, Councillor McCann. Uh, I do recognize the potential for uh, some other institution, uh, some institution out there, I guess, to try and take free money to uh, augment their sale. But um, if the purpose is for affordable housing, and that is specifically mentioned in the motion, you can't just do a study for market development, like how many condos can I get on here? You can't do that uh, by the motion. It must be an affordable housing project and it's gotta be a nonprofit or charitable organization. So, uh, you know, I'm gonna say the risk of that is extremely low. Uh, so I probably wouldn't support it. Sure, and uh, you mean tell me if I'm uh, if I'm falling on my uh, lines here. Any other comments on that? I mean, like I say, I would do this offline, but you mean um, uh, since we're having city council right after, we don't really have that opportunity to discuss this. And just so we're clear here, I agree with you, Mayor Lehman. The the probability is probably minute at best. Uh, I'm just like the, the taxpayer to know that we've got you know uh, both eyes on the ball. That that's really all this was really intended for. Okay, uh, Councilor Morales, I saw you indicate. Uh, perfect. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Uh, Councillor McCann, I support what you want to do. I don't support your motion, and I'm going to explain why. Similar to the, the tail end of what uh, Mary Lehman was saying, um, again, there's probably not going to be a lot of people that do that for the value add just for that purpose. That, that's, that was their intent going in. But here's my thing. As Mayor Lehman said, if they sell it to uh, um, a, a, an affordable housing provider or developer whose intent is to do that, that's awesome. Um, and I know there's a lot of people always have concern. Oh, well, you know, that developer isn't feasible. They're not going to be able to do that project. They're just going to get the zoning, make some money and flip it. I, I always have, I always, I'm always, I, I always kind of smile when I hear that argument of uh, reasons why we shouldn't allow rezoning, um, a, a group or an entity that buys land at a premium, sometimes of millions of dollars because of an, uh, of a different type of zoning, um, they don't, they're not in the business of burning money. So if they're willing to pay a million dollars extra, they're likely to develop it or provide some sort of value add to it. So uh, the intent is that places of worship or institutions uh, get this $20,000, do a block plan and the, uh, and the art of the possible, and then you know come to market, go to the tendering process, and then we see units being built. And if they realize that, you know what? They found a parcel in a neighboring municipality that's more rural, that's more appropriate for their congregation, and they can continue their congregation, uh, get some cash because you know places of worship are struggling a lot more than decades ago. 
Um, but they, they, they much rather give it to a, a developer that is totally at the same table with the city of Bay Area providing units, then it's a win-win for everybody. So I don't share the same concerns over increasing value on the land and flipping it, as long as there's some sort of contingency that the person buying it obviously also has intent to provide some sort of housing. So unless you can change the wording on your amendment, otherwise I, I'm, I'm happy uh, for them to take 20. And again, it's, it's 20 grand, not to say it's not much, but it's basically a block plan. Any other comments, members of general committee? Councillor Reitman. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, I have three comments. I'm I'm supportive of, of what uh, we're trying to do here. Um, there are there are kind of three caveats though that uh, we should be clear on. Sorry, um, Councillor Reitman. Just before you get into it, uh, what I'm doing right now is uh, Councillor McCann had a potential amendment. Uh, okay. He didn't move it, but uh, I'm just looking for any comments, feedback on that. Then we'll let Councillor McCann complete his comments and then I'll move on on the uh, full motion. Sorry about that. So uh, did you have a comment on the um, uh, on Councillor McCann's concern? No, I'll, I'll, I'll speak about the full motion. Okay, have a comeback. Uh, thanks. Any other comments uh, related to the potential amendment? Uh, uh, Councillor Congal? Thank you, Your Worship. Just quickly, as I sit on the affordable housing uh, task group, uh, with you, I think I want to thank Councillor McCann for raising the questions, but um, I'm not supportive of the amendment. I think the dialogue has helped perhaps the public and, and broader council appreciate um, how this is framed. And I do, um, as commented, trust the current scope of the target audience and, and opportunity. So I'm comfortable with the uh, the original motion. Will not be supporting the amendment. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other comments on that piece? Okay, I'll go back to you, Councillor McCann. Uh, and thank you, Mayor Lehman. And just, you know, for clarification, this was not an amendment. This was just a question uh, because we are okay. having the council next. So uh, obviously, clearly, there's not an appetite, which, like I say, this was a very small thing. But I think I do have an amendment uh, to your item. Uh, I'm a firm believer in accountability. And, uh, you know, for seven years, we've been talking about getting a plan. And to tell you the truth, this actually may be the best one I've seen. And uh, so I am fully supportive of it. But I would actually like to... Uh, um, maybe have a little more skin in the game. And uh, I would like to see a report back to council uh, in a private session, because we'll be talking about uh, uh, names that report back in, well, maybe I'll ask uh, Mayor Lehman, when do you, if this passes tonight, when do you plan on staff uh, reaching out to all the organizations? Yeah, for a question, actually, I'll go to Ms. Banfield. Um, and uh, just by way of context, members, uh, <laughs> Uh, we actually have been trying to do this for a little while uh, through direct contact with some of the organizations. And I think Ms. Miller referenced, we have had a number come forward and I believe there are two current applications. What sparked this particular item and uh, for the timing purpose, um, it's important. You'll remember our last public meeting in June uh, under the Planning Act was to consider changes to various affordable housing regulations. There was a lot of discussion around accessory suites, but one of those changes that staff brought to the public meeting was allowing housing as of right on institutionally designated lands. You can't do this today. So I'm, we're not jumping the gun with this item, but we would, we would have to approve that uh, before the projects themselves could proceed. So uh, Councilman McCain, the answer to your question is, um, uh, really depends on when the planning department intends to bring uh, the bylaw forward that would permit this. Uh, Ms. Banfield, uh, I, I don't know if all of the changes that are proposed are planning to come forward at the same time or whether this one would be on a different timeline, but could you comment? Absolutely, thank you, Mayor Lehman. So the intention is that the staff report will be at the first planning committee in September, okay. and then the bylaw would follow thereafter. Uh, we haven't structured the bylaw. It might make sense to make this a separate one in case other items happen, but but we'll work on that and make sure that it's brought forward as, as concisely and, and clearly as possible. Uh, but the intent is, is definitely in at that first planning committee meeting. Okay, so that would allow us, Councillor McCann, probably to proceed with this in October. Okay, October. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Lehman and uh, Ms. Banfield. So, like I say, you may you may be wondering what I mean by say skin in the game. Well, I think accountability is is something that uh, a lot of uh, processes thrive on, and I would like to see a report back to uh, to us, Council, um, in whatever fashion you know, Mayor Lehman, you think is best fit. Because I'd like to know who they've reached out to. I'd like to know the comments. I'd like to uh, get involved and see what they're thinking. And uh, you know, some of the best. Salespeople, I would hope, 
to think that the city of Barrie has is the 11 of us uh, or the 10 of us that are staring at me right now. Right. And we're out there, we're talking to our bishops, we're talking to our, um, you know, our priests are talking to you and say, hey, guess what? Do you know this is available? Well, let me contact, let me connect you to Michelle Banfield. Boom, boom, boom. And all of a sudden we could uh, maybe come back at budget time wanting to raise this budget from 200000 to $2 million because it's such an effective project. So that would be an amendment I would have, Mayor Lehman, that we would uh, report back. I would just need some direction what a respectable time period would be. Hopefully it's at Christmas time. Um, hopefully it's not, you know, next summer because obviously it's election year next year. Um, and uh, so the sooner the better. I think four months should be a, uh, a good time to create the sense of urgency. And, uh, you know, let's, let's, let's get in this together. So my, uh, do you need clarification on my amendment or do you kind of got what I'm getting at? Uh, so my suggestion, Councillor McCann, would be that um, uh, staff report back by memo, uh, we could just add that at the end of paragraph one, um, as to, you know, we could direct that staff report back by memo as to the level of interest uh, from the organizations, um, and I'd be fine with the end of the year for the timing of that. Um, I would just invite you to attend the Affordable Housing Task Force. Uh, we, uh, we've had a number of meetings, as uh, I know you're aware, by memo that we circulated uh, earlier in the summer. Uh, and this is an item that's come up and it's, um, it, it's, uh, it's one that the members of the task force really had a lot of interest in moving forward with quickly. So, um, you know, I think we will continue our discussions. Task force will be meeting monthly uh, for the next three or four months as we continue to bring items like this forward to fight the housing crisis in Barrie. Uh, and I'd certainly invite you to come. Uh, you can uh, probably get a good sense of of where we're going at those meetings. Um, but I'm, uh, you know, by way of an amendment, if you wanted, uh, I would suggest uh, at the end of paragraph one that uh, we asked staff to report back by memo, say by the end of 2021 on the interest uh, from uh, property owners. Now, uh, if you don't mind, Mayor Lehman, if I have some dialogue with you, uh, a, a memo I think is probably a little too vague. I'm looking to really create a sense of urgency. And uh, how you do that is, you know, obviously, creating intensity. And I think that uh, if staff know, council knows, our community knows that we're all serious about this, I'd like to know why this church isn't interested. I'd like to know why this church or this organization is so enthusiastic. And uh, uh, and so I think if we actually had an in-camera meeting with like some real dialogue uh, and some feedback from our staff with real names, real organizations, uh, and um, I think that, this project will explode. I really do. So I, I memo, memo to me would, would be too uh, be too cloudy. I just like to have a uh, report back to staff in, in a closed door meeting, um, and um, let's talk about everything that they that they've discussed. Move an amendment. Okay, so uh, the wording would be that um, that staff report back. Miss um, Banfield it would uh, would. Uh, January be a good would be an enough time. Sorry, okay. Mayor Ms. Manfield. Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to uh, Council McCann, uh, we will do our best. That that sounds reasonable. Okay, would would December be reasonable as well? I'd like to get this done as soon as possible, but I, I definitely want to give you uh, set you up for success, not failure. Right. So, what's through your you, Lehman. time? <laughs> Through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor McCann, um, staff will are having a whole bunch of affordable housing initiatives that that we're working on, and so um, as I said, so we we will do our best to uh, to triage those and, and get as much in front of council as quickly as possible. Okay, so then um, uh, through you, Mayor Lee, Miss Cook, what would be an appropriate date in uh, in December? What, what's what, what's the last meeting we have in December? Ms. Cook. Um, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Through you to Councillor McCann, the last meeting in December is December 13th, and that is also a double meeting night. It would be a general committee and a council night. Um, so would your suggestion be, through you, Mayor Lehman, uh, what, day, what, what day do you think would be best, uh, um, Ms. Cook? Um, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor McCann, um, based on... Um, what we have going on in December, we have a budget meeting starting November 25th, and then they'll carry on through to um, for final council approval on December 13th. 
So I would suggest probably January would be a more opportune time to report back for um, based on if Ms. Banfield is um, okay with the timelines. Okay, could you give me a date in January, Ms. Cook, then please? Not having the next year's calendar in front of me, but it would be the first general committee meeting would be the Monday immediately following the Christmas holidays. So okay. I'm not sure of the exact date. How about this then? Uh, that, that we have a uh, uh, that we have uh, that staff report back uh, to council in a closed door session uh, with some a date in January that will be decided between the mayor and uh, the cook, uh, the cook, the clerk. Uh, sorry, <laughs> the clerk. And uh, uh, and discuss the um, the uh, what word do I want to use to discuss the um, success of the uh, of the uh, the quick start for affordable housing project and institutional lands. Okay, uh, that is an amendment moved by Councilor McCann uh, on the amendment. Okay, um, I need to express some real concerns with this. Uh, the issue is this. Uh, with great respect to all of us, and I include myself in this, members of council, nothing slows things down more than staff having to um, report, prepare a presentation, and then react to uh, 11 different members of council's views on them. Um, I think Councillor McCann's intent, if it is to uh, create energy and uh, um, a greater um, reporting, uh, I would certainly support that. Um, what I'm very concerned about is um, the, uh, the notion that um, members of council would get involved in discussing these individual projects, getting involved with the individual landowners and so forth. Should we promote the opportunity? A hundred percent. I would love it if the 10 of you would join with the work that we're already doing to try and encourage uh, organizations that might be eligible here. And if any member of council, that's why I was inviting you to the task force, Council McCann, if, if anyone wants to be part of that effort, I would welcome the help. Um, what I don't want to do, and I would be quite concerned with, uh, is uh, uh, tell staff that there's going to be 11 people involved in managing each of these feasibility studies uh, and discussing the individual potential on each site. That's not the role of council. I think the role of council is to set policy uh, to build programs, to bring forward projects, um, but it's it's not to get involved in individual potential applications until they come forward through the planning process. And that's my biggest concern, members of council, is this. Uh, you may be asked to sit in judgment of a planning application on one of these sites. Now, the whole point of the, de the designations is to make it easier for these organizations to come forward with a project. And so, uh, it may be that all 10 of these studies come um, with only a site plan requirement, but that's very unlikely. What's much more likely is that um, we will ultimately have to um, uh, be the decision makers on the planning application. And um, which I, it would surely fetter our judgment to be involved, especially in an in-camera meeting, um, which I don't believe we could do to begin with. And, and that's the other thing, Councillor McCann. I mean, uh, I, just because it has to do with a piece of property doesn't mean we can move in camera. It's only if we're selling property or acquiring property. And the city is, I'm certainly not proposing that the city would sell or acquire any of these sites. So the meetings would have to be public. Um, so I think the intent uh, probably is is a good one. And I actually, I really welcome your enthusiasm, Councilor McCann, and the enthusiasm of other members of council. I just think if the point is to uh, uh, light a fire, and help make sure that uh, that we're hearing about what's coming out of this. I don't care whether it's a report or uh, or a memo, um, but I would certainly uh, not support. Uh, we could you can't go on camera anyway; it'd be illegal. Uh, and secondly, I don't think it's going to make the process go faster. I think it's going to make it go slower. So if the if your amendment was changed to require a report back from staff uh, at the first meeting in January, hundred percent favor. Um, I think the task force reports, uh, Councillor Harris and Deputy Mayor Ward and I are all intending to bring those forward per council's direction in December anyway. So that would be a great opportunity for us to report on the initial progress. Um, but if you want to specify it, um, I think, you know, that kind of report back uh, is, is, would be fine by me. But members of the general committee, I'm gonna, I really would have uh, a lot of concerns with the, the notion that's just been outlined um, because I don't think we can even do it legally. 
uh, on the amendment, I do want to call the question. Uh, Councilor McCann, go ahead. I mean, all that, thank you, Mayor Lehman. If it's illegal, then obviously I don't want to put an amendment that's illegal. Uh, this is the unfortunate uh, process when we have back-to-back -back meetings and, and that we don't have time to talk to staff. Okay, well, you know what? It's, uh, it's unfortunate. I mean, because uh, uh, I do actually differ uh, with opinion, which uh, isn't new for you and I, Mayor Lehman. Um, but if the best I can get uh, with this short notice is, uh, is a report back uh, in December, uh, and in that report, uh, we're going to, uh, like, I'm just, like, I'm not interested in wasting anybody's time here, especially mine. Uh, and if this report's going to be all high level and, and not really any specifics, um, then I'm just unclear on what, what this report legally uh, and professionally will report back on. Um, and once again, I, I apologize to council. I would rather have done this offline. But uh, we're voting on this uh, at City Council when we get through this meeting. So, sure, let's get a report back, and uh, and um, in in December that'll be my my uh, my um, uh, amendment. Okay, Councilor McCann, can I uh, request th that that be part of the task force's report? At the, and uh, what we can do is make that specific so that it meets your intent, which is that uh, that the affordable housing task force report back specifically on the interest from property owners in uh, uh in this program in the in our report in december sure. okay all right so that would be an amendment at the end of paragraph one uh, members of the general committee are we clear on the amendment council morales go ahead thank you uh mayor lehman i don't know if this is a point of order or point of uh procedure privilege um your clarification was incredible as to the original motion i know the mayor usually speaks last that's why you kind of saw everybody go yep we're good and then you spoke I have a couple of procedure questions for the clerk. I was wondering if as the chair, you could just allow the procedure questions since you provided such clarity that it really just changed the entire intent of the, uh, of, of the amendment. It's on the amendment, Councilor Morales? Yes. Yeah, go ahead then, yeah. Okay, thank you. I just wanted, because uh, yeah. again, the mayor does uh, yeah. speak loud. Ms. Ms. Cook, what's the difference between what Councilor McCann is proposing and Councilor McCann jump in if I'm interpreting it wrong, that staff essentially have an in-camera meeting, usually, you know, Sir Robert Barry, something like that. And they say, hey, look, we contacted 32. Uh, we got four voicemails that were never returned. 25 got back to us, 20 got to the table. Uh, you know, 15 said no, uh, three said, let's go, that kind of thing. And having names and discussion, what is different from that request than in the past where we've had in-camera meetings where we're discussing about, um, interactions with uh, potential investors uh, to do with our strategic plan initiatives, such as a convention center, such as community, private, private community spaces, things of that nature. What is, what is the difference? Because in those instances, we also don't, we're not, you know, a potential convention center, I'll keep it as vague as possible. It's just, it's been reported in the media before. We don't necessarily own the land. It's just, it's invest Barry and the CAO coming to us and providing back and forth. And we've had meetings for those. So what is the technical difference between those meetings we've had with staff before and what Councilor McCann is proposing, which is a very commercial real estate like perspective, like show me your leads, show me what the follow-ups were, show me the outcomes and show me why this said, why this said no. I'm wondering why it's yes to the other one, but no to this one. Uh, Madam Clerk, do you want to clarify why one is in camera, one isn't? Um, thank you, Mayor Lehman. I'm just trying to an answer here. Um, so they, the reason that this one wouldn't be in camera is because essentially we are talking about um, planning applications and planning applications or anything like that are public information. Um, but to um, generally when uh, members of council ask for a report back, they don't specify whether it's in camera or out of camera. It's generally, we kind of go determining on what the content of the report is. So maybe seeing what the content of the potential report would be, we could see what is under, if it falls under um, parameters of section 239 of the Municipal Act, but just on the initial basis of what is being asked, I don't see a category that it falls under, under section 239. So thank you, Ms. Cook, and through you, Mayor Lehman, um, you were talking about planning applications have to be in the public realm. Um, the one clarity of that is these aren't planning applications yet. We're kind of creating, this item of discussion is so awesome that it creates this new field of bringing people to the table, the act of the possible. So I don't think we're limited by planning application uh, public requirements. 
and specifically public applications uh, as it stands, uh, if they're not formal applications, but they're at the pre-consultation stage, pre-consultations are confidential. Mm -hmm. So That's somebody correct. can do a pre-consultation, pay 1800 bucks, 1600 I don't know what the rate is now, have a meeting, put some papers on the desk, and that is all technically very confidential. So um, this is almost like the pre-consultation to the pre-consultation. So uh, again, I'm not the clerk. Uh, and this is awesome that we're having a really collaborative discussion, by the way, I'm, I'm energized. So I just, I hope that there is a way uh, that we can have that in camera because it's technically not planning applications. It's almost like kicking tires, but in a more fruitful, uh, constructive way. And yeah, I'm just using the pre-consultations as my premise that um, they, are, they are confidential. So appreciate that, Councilman Ronison. You're right, but those pre-consultations are with staff. Uh, anything that City Council does, anything that we do, anything that a quorum of Council does, six of us do, uh, must follow the Municipal Act, and that means it must be in public, uh, unless it fits one or two, of, uh, one or more of the very specific categories outlined in the legislation. So it's not really about the planning uh, process. Uh, although I raise the concern and I maintain it's quite a serious one that if we stick our fingers in to uh, a potential planning application before it comes to council, somebody who's opposed to that application later may very rightly be able to say council fettered its judgment. It was in favor of this before it ever was public knowledge. Um, but just on the issue of, of transparency, um, we, 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 can't, we, we can't do anything in camera uh, that is specified under the act, nor should we. So... Um, I don't believe it is um, appropriate for us to, to get into a discussion with property owners, especially as a group, um, uh, when that is specifically prevented under, under the Act. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Mayor Lehman. I 100% agree that we shouldn't, as a group, be uh, in, in doing that discussion. So uh, thank you, Ms. Cook, for your response. And, and I guess this is to either of you or both. Is there no middle ground to that? So do I agree that council as a group shouldn't be engaging in the discussion with a potential applicant? Absolutely. Uh, do I feel that if one, an applicant, a church institution reaches out to a member of council and say, hey, I've heard about this in the media and the member of council goes, great, I'm gonna refer to you to staff and let's have an initial discussion. And that's, that's appropriate. Is there a happy middle where staff can come to us and again, the figurative sort of barrier room and go, here are 30, here are the people and the names. And it was never a quorum of council that, that engaged with the potential applicant. It was always staff. There's that very segregated uh, 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 division of staff is the point of contact and council is not reviewing the applications. Council is almost reviewing why did staff have success with some and why they didn't have success with the others. I'm totally fine as long as it's a public discussion. Okay, um, great. So I'll leave it to the mover of the amendment. Um, I, I'd love that. Uh, maybe I think we might have to redact names, unfortunately, Councilor McCann, but I think that discussion is worth having. I love the, the fact of accountability. They do that in sales. They do that in, in commercial real estate. And maybe it's our approach. It, it's our approach. And maybe it has nothing to do with staff. Maybe it's staff is doing an excellent job, but it, maybe we get context as to why. There might be drainage issues on some of those sites. There might be right of ways from the province of Ontario with the highways. I know that that kind of um, affected previous uh, potential institutions from doing something years ago. So I want all that context, but uh, yeah, I'll support it. Uh, Councillor McGann, if you can somehow find a way for us to do it within the confines of the Municipal Act. Okay, uh, the amendment as currently on the floor was uh, the Council McCann's request that the Affordable Housing Task Force specifically report back on the uh, success of the uh, program or project, whatever you want to call it, uh, in encouraging applications from uh, these properties uh, and certainly the task force could do that in its report to you in December, members of general committee. Uh, Councilor McCann, go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, yeah, dude, I really appreciate uh, Councilor Morales' insight. I do have to ask him one question. Uh, has he been watching on uh, Glenn Gehring and Dan Ross lately? And uh, just all your sales uh, uh, information was funny. So why don't we do, why don't we keep it, keep it simple, we'll report back in a, uh, in a staff report. And then obviously uh, in that report, if there's some more information that we need, we can address it uh, that night in council. I think that would be the easiest and cleanest. Um, I was just looking out for the property owners is really what I was doing. And just trying to, as you said, create some, uh, create some energy, create some synergy. So thank you. So hopefully everyone votes yes for it. I think this would be uh, great for our community. 
sorry, members of the general committee, are you clear on the amendment? Yes, okay, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the amendment? Opposed? One, okay, two, I'm opposed as well. Um, sorry, no, you'd amended that to be the task force report. I'm in favor of it. My apologies, I wanna make that clear. I'm in favor of that amendment. Um, so uh, are there further comments, questions, discussion on this item? We do have a number of others tonight. Councilor Morales, go ahead. Very quick ones, my apologies, Mayor Lehman. Um, I'm, I'm, my video might go blank. I'm just pulling it up here on Legislar. Uh, that we meant paragraph one that says to allow housing as a right on their properties, um, inviting them to contact the city for the potential construction of affordable housing and, uh, and or uh, uh, purpose-built student housing on the properties and an amendment to paragraph two, where's the next time that it's mentioned? Do, 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 do. Uh, second line, feasibility studies for affordable housing and or purpose-built student housing projects. Uh, and I can speak to that. Okay, the amendment would broaden this from affordable housing to include purpose-built student housing. Uh, Councillor Morales, go ahead. Thank, thank you, Mary Lehman. Uh, in the spirit of my previous amendments where, yeah, is it redundant or does it need to be done or do we just leave it alone as it captured? This one is to me very clear. I, I would love feedback from members of council uh, as I did earlier. Um, by the definition of affordable housing that it needs to hit a certain percentage of income and then it's considered affordable housing. I don't think purpose-built student housing is captured in that because students by definition are students and some of them might have, I don't know, a part-time job or a full-time summer job. So their income is likely going to be, you know, below 15,000 a year, 20,000. That's a very generous range. So if we're going off the technical definition of affordable housing, um, this purpose-built student housing isn't captured in the scope of affordable housing. The reason I want to include it there is there might be institutions and places of worship um, in the city of Barrie that would make great locations for purpose-built student housing. And we had a very pr productive discussion in May about why, are, why is the private industry not responding, right? Uh, why is there a gap between uh, more enrollment and the college growing and the private industry not responding and therefore the market pushing it to our single detached homes in uh, the East End, Ward 1, Ward 2, and a bit in Ward 3. And I think this is a very reasonable ask. And like I said earlier, it's all about the marketing. So whenever that employee in the city of Barrie makes that call and goes, hey, if you didn't already hear it, we've got this great item for discussion about the art of the possible, which by the way, you should trademark Mayor Lehman. Um, and uh, the art of the possible, uh, we can get, we can, we can, uh, you know, get, uh, get some possibility in a block plan and a vision. There might be other uh, fees that are uh, waived, uh, possibly VCs or other costs. And in addition to that, it's not just affordable housing, it's purpose-built uh, student uh, rental. I think it's, uh, it's a great possibility um, and can uh, be very productive, uh, especially for the Northeast end of Barrie, since the private market has not really responded for at least seven years. Okay, we have an amendment uh, from Council Morales. Those on uh, who wish to speak in the amendment, Council Reap. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to su support that amendment. Um, and I know that it's going to be uh, in my ward that it's most likely to happen. And um, frankly, I, I think that's a great idea. Um, if there is an institution that is looking at affordable housing, um, they may also, uh, as an option, look at, um, at uh, purpose-built student housing. Um, I think there's going to be a limited number because uh, distance plays a big role in that. But um, I can think of at least one uh, in Ward 1 that uh, you know, might rise to that, uh, that bait. So um, I'd be interested in, in seeing if we get anybody that um, responds to that. So I, I'm in support of that. Thanks, Councillor Rima. Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Worship. Um, so very, you know, initial thinking on this for me is around, um, does this take away or could it have any type of um, uh, create a separation from a strategic task group mandate that we are trying to support moving forward? And so I'd be looking to hear if uh, there's perceptions about this being an impact about um, broadening the scope at this point in time, um, or whether this just allows um, those interested. But if I think about the money that we're committed to try and drive and incentivize this from an affordable housing lens, um, I perhaps don't fully appreciate the impact that could happen if we open up to student built housing. But I, 
my initial reaction is it kind of changes the intention of driving the strategy forward and does the student housing conversation occur at a different level or can be a next step when we get that memo back to say you know there are some really great other opportunities here they might not have fit affordable housing or that concept but maybe they open the door to other possibilities i just didn't want to see applications that may detract from the initial intention of affordable housing permanent housing Okay, uh, thanks, Councillor Kungle. Uh, thank Councillor Morales. Oh, I can speak. Yeah, thank you, Mary Lehman. I don't know if that was a direct question or comment, but thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, Councillor Kungle, uh, short answer: No, it does not take away. Um, it enhances because it's it's very comprehensive. More long answer that is important, and I'll do my best to keep it focused. Um, affordable housing, attainable housing, <laughs> housing is one hundred percent affected by the inability to create purpose-built student housing in a city as a, as a mid-sized city, we're not a region where we have a, a college uh, as a main economic driver. Here is why. When enrollment goes up with students and the corresponding student housing, uh, either on campus or private purpose-built off market does not keep up with that growth, what happened is those there's now an incentive for investors, usually landlords, to buy single detached family homes, townhouses, and other homes that are intended to be places to live for, the, for people who just want, you know, it's nothing fancy, they just want affordable housing. They are now competing for that housing with investors. So investors that are buying for the purpose of an investment cash flow property are now beating out people of reasonable means who would have bought that property um, or who would have rented that property because they can't afford to buy. So it has a direct correlation. You're, 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 you're almost creating a condition where your investors go, hey, let's go to Barry because uh, students are, are, are literally, uh, uh, not have no place to live, and now they're competing for that single detached home. And I think no place knows it better than the East End. Houses on Dunsmore, Hickling, Johnson, uh, Grove, that used to be family here, have now completely changed in the last 10 years, and now they're student rental housings. And it's, it's, it's not just greed, it is market forces. So by not addressing purpose-built student housing, it's having severe spillover effects into the private family rental market, the senior rental market, uh, and also purchasing. So they are 100, it's not a, if we focus on student housing by including this one word in each of the paragraphs, do we take away from affordable housing? It, they are so uh, related. And uh, again, as someone who, who, who has almost spent 20 years in the Northeast and a Barrie, you can literally see it in, in the community and you can hear people's stories uh, on how that uh, supply constraint uh, is interconnected. Okay, uh, thanks Councilor Morales. Others on the amendment? Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, thank you, Mary Lehman. Hopefully a quick question. I'm trying to recall the details, but I believe uh, a little while ago we had a conversation about housing and engaging with Georgian College at least the students. And I think um, a small group was included in that. Um, would, would that, uh, is there some update that might give some um, support to either including or, or excluding what Councilor Morales is suggesting um, as it relates to the you know at the time there was lots of commentary about um, what Georgian College was doing to support um, housing stock for its students. So I don't know if that's I, I think the Councilor Ritmo or Cal Mary Lehman. Yeah, Lee yeah. the uh, the meeting happened uh, within a couple uh, about two weeks, I guess, at Council's direction. Um, Councilor Morales, Councilor Ritmo, myself, the leadership from Georgian, as specified in the motion. Uh, the short answer from Georgian is they will be lucky to get back to the same student levels uh, that um, they were pre-pandemic um, for some time. So uh, they saw it as uh, something where there is probably a little bit of time to work on that. Uh, they certainly recognized the, the concern. Uh, I don't think it really relates to this motion, Councillor uh, Jim Harris, and the reason why is um, this is uh, specifies only institutionally all the, um, although I was going to introduce the amendment around uh, other places of worship. So we'll come back to that. But it's only a very small number of properties uh, and they must be owned by a nonprofit or charitable organization. So while Council Morales is right, there are lots of developers out there. They're not eligible. So uh, even if the amendment passes, the only organizations that could take advantage of this are nonprofit or charities. Because uh, I'm, I'm not interested in funding private developers feasibility studies. I think that's something private developers can do. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. 
Yeah, thank you, Marlene. I was really just, you know, thinking about, you know, if if we were to accept the amendment to include purpose-built student housing, I was wondering if this work with the college wasn't kind of addressing that so we wouldn't need to add it here, given we know that we are in a significant deficit of having enough affordable housing in our community. So it was hopeful that maybe there were some positive efforts being done at the college side to address student housing needs, which would then mean we wouldn't need to approve the amendment here to add um, purpose-built student housing to you, to the, the, um, the motion. So thank you. Okay, thanks. Any other comments on the amendment, members of general committee? Okay, then I'll call the question. Sorry, go ahead, Councilor McCann. <clears throat> thank you, Mary Lee. You know, just a quick definition. Uh, why is student housing not fall under the, the umbrella of affordable housing? Can you hear I think me? I could unmute by now after 18 months. Um, I'm going to actually ask Ms. Banfield to answer that, but um, because some of it can be quite expensive, I guess would be the short answer. Uh, Ms. Banfield, do you want to uh, indicate what student housing would be considered under affordable housing and what wouldn't? Through you, Mary Lehman, to Councillor uh, McCann. So ultimately, the, the term affordable housing is a defined term based on, um, on annual income, and it's tied to um, our basically our, our city of Barrie geographic area. So um, it, there's not necessarily something that's saying it's not considered affordable, but, um, but ultimately it's, it's not necessarily defined um, affordable housing. Glad I asked the question, thank you. On the amendment, uh, any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the amendment, please indicate. Those opposed to the amendment. Okay, that fails. Um, uh, I do have one more. Are there any other amendments that anyone wishes to bring forward? Okay, then I'll ask Deputy Mayor Ward to take the chair. Okay. Mayor Lehman, do you have an <laughs> amendment? I do, Deputy Mayor oh, Ward. Surprise. Uh, and uh, thank you for that. Uh, it would be to add to the end of paragraph one, the words and further contact places of worship designated residential with potel potentially developable lands for the same purpose. And then it would be to add the words or residential after institutionally in the second paragraph. And I'll just explain the impact of that without giving you a whole speech. I think, uh, sorry. Uh, so that's the amendment, Deputy Mayor Ward. Yeah, would you like to speak to it? Okay. Um, so yes, uh, Deputy Mayor Ward's quite right. There are a number of churches that are designated residential that do have additional lands uh, available. Uh, there are a few other in um, places of worship, uh, not just churches. Let's uh, not just ice, uh, limit it to that, of course. Uh, but uh, there are uh, a number of both uh, churches and other places of worship around the city of Barrie that aren't designated institutional. And I would like them the opportunity to uh, access the same funding for institution or for uh, potential affordable housing projects. Um, uh, the impact of adding or residential on the second one, uh, there is the risk there that um, we could have nonprofit or charitable organizations um, that are uh, residential. It, it would it could expand the number of properties. It will expand the number of properties that are eligible. Uh, but I think the whole point of this is that there are um, organizations out there with excess lands. Uh, and while I don't support uh, funding private development um, or developer costs in this way, I certainly believe whether it's a service club or a religious organization, um, the point here is to support those that may have potential for us and may have an interest. Uh, and frankly, to stimulate more of the kind of projects that we have already seen, because I think they're great places to live and they are. Uh, great candidates for affordable housing often. Okay, thank you. You've heard the amendment. Any comments or questions? Mary Lehman, I'm running a much more efficient meeting than you are. No questions. You are comments. <laughs> Any, uh, I'll call the vote then. All in favor? It is carried. I will turn it back to you. I don't know, Deputy Mayor Ward. I think you should run it. Uh, thanks very much for that, Barry. On the main motion, further comments? 
Councillor Reitma, yes, of course, come back to you. Go ahead. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, I'm, I'm uh, very supportive of, of where we've been tonight and um, where, where we're at. Um, uh, so I'm going to support the motion uh, as amended. I, I, I don't want to rain on the parade, but I do want to just have three caveats that we should all be aware of. Um, the first one is uh, that at the moment, uh, and I think you mentioned it earlier, um, uh, institu institutional designated properties um, are not eligible for residential development. And, and so we do have to make that change to the bylaw and eventually to the official plan uh, in order to allow that to happen. So um, that's number one. Number two, um, I have um, concerns about our definitions of affordability. Um, I, I'm not sure, and I'm not, certainly not satisfied that when we call it affordable, that it really is affordable for those that really need it. And I have a concern about how long does it become or stay affordable as well. So I, I, I just would like to sort of add that into the back of everyone's mind that um, we really need to address that. And the final um, uh, thing that I, I think we should be aware of is that we are dealing with nonprofit charitable organizations. Um, and um, this will help them to do their initial feasibility work. But um, there's, if you're going to move a project beyond that, uh, there's a lot more money required in order to get a, a building built, um, even getting it approved. And so um, we need to be prepared that um, these, uh, these nonprofits, if they uh, intend to go ahead, will be having to, de to develop in conjunction with some financing partner, be that a developer, be that a bank, be that something else. Um, so um, we will, in all likelihood, down the road, uh, not be dealing with a uh, nonprofit. Uh, in the end. Um, so as long as we're aware of those three items, I think that um, that's fair. Um, I think that it's great that the task force uh, is going to report on this uh, by the end of the year. I, I think we will be able to see how well we're progressing with this great idea. And I think um, uh, I would encourage staff, if um, if you're working on uh, on, on somebody, someone in the, uh, or an organization in a ward, to contact the ward counselor and uh, see if we can put our shoulder to the wheel as well, um, because maybe that uh, might just help as well. So those are my comments. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks for that, Councilor Reitman. And again, yeah, I would certainly appreciate the help from any and all members of general committee. Uh, any other comments on the motion as amended? Councilor Morales. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. This is quite possibly one of the most significant things we've done in probably a year and a half uh, to increase affordability in Barrie. Like we're gonna look back at this and this is what I mean, members of council. There are families that are no longer, you know, those stories we hear in the Toronto media of people, you know, uh, facing rent evictions or their rent was 1200 and they're looking at a very comparable unit. They have to move different end of the GTA or whatever. Now the rent is 2,800 a month, 3000. Those stories, while those numbers are not in Barry yet, they're starting to pop up. Uh, you know, everybody saw the real estate market this spring and summer of 80 to $150,000 over asking. Um, that used to be the cost of a home, uh, of a, of, of a uh, you know, uh, humble townhouse or humble uh, semi in the early 2000s. Think of that. That it, I had a resident in my ward at a public meeting say that he has made more money and he's got a full-time career job. He has made more money in appreciation in the last five years from just sitting on his home and existing than he has from his salary. So this, taking underutilized land inst that institutions have and getting construction, whether it's the charity, not-for-profit in conjunction with the county, with the city, with a, 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 a housing provider, with a developer, I, I don't care. <laughs> Please build it. Please build it appropriately. Please add supply because people who want to live in Barrier are getting to the point where they can no longer afford to live and they're leaving, not because they want to, but, be, but because they have no other option. I do caution one thing for all of us. Um, careful what we wish for. Because if we get 30 institutions that come back and say, yep, I want to add 150 units on my parcel, we're going to hear it from our residents. Inten in 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 intensification 
uh, you know what, I love it, but just not in this location. Uh, this road wasn't meant for that. We're going to hear it. And it's, uh, this is, uh, I'm going to keep my positive tone. It is not a shame thing. It is a, let's just be ready that in the best case scenario where this art of the possible item for discussion is, is, is a success story, we need to be prepared to deal with each application on a per application basis, of course, but we need to be ready for the reality. And I think um, it's, it, it's, it's going to be tough, but it is a very necessary discussion if we're going to allow uh, current and future generations to be able to stay here uh, in the town that they grew up in or in the town they chose to locate to. So I'll be supporting, I'll be voting in favor of it. Thanks, Council Morales. Any other comments from members of general committee? Uh, Councillor Owen. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, I am supportive of the motion as well. And thank you to Councillor Ritmo for bringing up some important caveats about this work. I think that's important for us to remember. Um, I think the biggest barrier that not profit, not for profit and charitable organizations face is capital funding for these projects. And we need the provincial and federal governments to really step up to the plate. Uh, we have a couple projects in the work that could really use uh, their support in terms of capital funding right now. So um, hopefully we can keep advocating for that um, while taking these small but important steps. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Any other comments? Uh, just a few things that have come up uh, and Councillor Owen, just jumping off that, you'll be pleased to hear the task force as, as you saw in the memo, the two issues we're tackling are availability of land and funding. Um, far too often our projects are getting stalled because we are awaiting a response on a particular program of housing funding. We're gonna need a sustainable local source uh, if we are going to ourselves as a city or a county or a community tackle this issue. Uh, I won't make a speech about how critical the need for affordable housing is. You all know we are now the most expensive city in Ontario, more than Toronto in terms of rent. Uh, and so projects like this are, that's why I brought this forward in August. I could have waited for the planning approval, uh, you know, or brought up forward in the task force report in December. Um, but I want us to be ready to hit go the day after we, we uh, approve the change. Um, uh, if uh, in, indeed it ultimately is approved, uh, but given the support already, I think it was a fair bet. So staff can plan for this as a next step if we implement that bylaw. Um, and I, I I'll just say this, you know, there's a South End mega church that is already well advanced with a project. A number, uh, I think members of council are aware of this project and they were only able to do that because they have an incredible team of people associated with their church who have experience in land development, planning and related matters. And they went God help from some others. Um, that project, it literally has no neighbors. It is not going to be a controversial one, but Councillor Morales, I think is right. There will be others that are in residential neighborhoods and we're gonna have to have the political will uh, to support those projects, such as the uh, one that uh, Redwood is proposed or is uh, well advanced in, in fact, on uh, the Salvation Army Church property on uh, on Lillian that uh, is in Deputy Mayor Ward's room. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, notwithstanding, we may have some of those uh, come forward as applications. I do think this is a substantial step. It's a proven one. It's worked in our city before. And much more importantly, I think many of these organizations, whether again, they're service clubs or places of worship, they wanna step up and help the community. And this is, this is a way to give them a little bit of help to be able to, uh, to partner with them uh, and bring the community together behind building more affordable housing. So thanks for your support on this members of council. Uh, on the motion as amended, I'll call the question. Uh, those in favor, please indicate. Anyone opposed? None. That carries unanimously. Members separate of general, report. any uh, separate reports been requested, Madam Clerk? So we'll have that one in a separate section. Uh, it is 10 after 9. We do have six more items that have been held. Uh, do we wish to take a recess or plow on uh, through the items? Does anyone want a recess? Nope. All right, let's get at it. Uh, the next item that's been held uh, is the item for discussion 8.3 regarding maintaining or cutting grass on municipal boulevards. It's put on by Councilor Reitman and held by Councilor McCann. Go ahead, Councilor McCann. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, you know, I'll be really short. I uh, I read this and I think it's great intent and uh, I have to agree with uh, Councilor Ritma when I see people not, um, you know, maintaining uh, their lawns, it, it definitely gets under my skin. But I'm just gonna be voting no for this. Uh, just the simple fact that uh, last year, you know, we uh, asked our residents uh, to give us some leeway because we were in a pandemic, we're still in a pandemic, we were starting a pandemic, we didn't want to go uh, too far down the rabbit hole in the red, 
uh, and we wanted to cut some costs. And so we didn't maintain our parks um, is one of the biggest issues. I've got many other issues uh, why uh, I don't uh, think that this is um, maybe the best item uh, discussion. Um, and that probably is because of the 2021 pandemic, but also timing. We're still in the pandemic. People have lost their homes or the verge of losing their homes. And here's another fist that we're throwing at them saying, hey, it's gonna cost you more money now because now you have to cut more grass, whether it's uh, you know fuel costs or whether it's uh, extra maintenance costs. So um, I'll be voting no, but I do appreciate the intent. Okay, uh, and Councilor McCann, I assume you wanna just put that item on the floor as printed just for discussion. I know you're gonna oppose it. Yep, okay, so that was uh, the items on the floor as printed. Uh, others who wish to comment, Councilor Ritma. Thank you, Mr. Lehman. Um, I put this on because um, of very significant um, interest from uh, the community. Um, and we have, um, you know, a number, not all, I mean, we're really pointing at maybe 1% uh, or maybe 0.1% of, of the boulevards in the city. 99.9% um, uh, .9 of the people cut them and there's no problem. Uh, but the small number that don't do it, um, it just makes the, the place look uh, poor and dis disheveled. Um, and the interesting thing is, is that uh, when we get complaints, um, the city goes out and cuts it. So um, it's the taxpayer that is um, cutting their boulevard that is uh, paying for uh, the city to go out and cut um, the grass for somebody that isn't doing what they you know, morally ought to be doing. Um, and more often than not, it's um, you know, uh, a landlord that uh, hasn't uh, made any arrangement or uh, very, poor arrangements for the cutting of the grass anyway. Um, so um, this is a request that staff take a look at this question um, because um, I think it does affect um, a lot of people in, in the community, uh, particularly in my ward. Um, and it's not fair to uh, the neighboring residents that uh, look after their properties uh, well. and. Um, we're not setting out in uncharted territory here. Um, there are uh, lots of municipalities in Ontario uh, that uh, have bylaws like this. Uh, you know, Brampton, uh, Toronto, Ottawa, Pickering, um, uh, Richmond Hill, just to name a few. So there's there's lots of them uh, that that have a similar uh, requirement. Um, and when you think about it, we already have a, a parallel requirement in the downtown. Um, if you don't shovel your snow in front of your uh, sidewalk, uh, the city will do it for you um, and, um, and send you the bill. Um, and this is no different. And I, I think that uh, what we really are trying to do is to uh, make Barry beautiful. And I think it is beautiful, but there's a few uh, folks that uh, don't cooperate with that. And um, the intention is, is that, you know, we would uh, uh, try to make that happen. So I would ask you for your support of this uh, so that staff can have a look at it and report back to us. Okay, thanks, Katsurima. Councillor Eowyn and then Councillor Kungal. Thank you, Mayor Lieben. Uh, I do have an amendment that have, has been circulated by email to all of council. Um, and it's a simple one. It's to add a second paragraph that staff in the operations department investigate ways to encourage naturalized boulevard gardens to reduce the need for grass maintenance while promoting pollinator habitats and report back to general committee. And I can speak to that. Okay, uh, Councillor Owen has an amendment uh, regarding naturalized boulevard gardens. Go ahead, Councillor Owen. All right, so the thinking behind this is that um, there are ways to ensure that you don't even have to cut the grass on your boulevard if you pro uh, plant a proper naturalized garden. Um, we do have guidelines for non-standard boulevard treatments uh, on the city's website. Um, it's restrictive in some ways and I'm hoping that through this amendment we can look at ways to um, encourage more of these boulevard gardens, remove some of the barriers to creating one, um, 
and reduce the need for mowing in the first place. I hate lawns. I'm just going to put that out there. And I think a boulevard garden would be beautiful on, in front of every home in the city. So I'd like to see uh, people take that up as much as possible. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Owen. On the amendment, Councillor Natalie Harris. Thank you, Mary Lehman. I support that 100%. Love it. And I'll just add a little uh, tidbit as well. Not only will um, uh, that help with the environment, but it also helps with noise pollution. Um, the lawn mowers that we have, we still have so many noisy gas mowers out there. And the less we put that into our neighborhood, the better. So I'm definitely all for this. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Ripa. Yes, I'd like to thank um, uh, Councillor Ewan for putting that amendment forward. I'm very supportive of that as well. Um, I think that uh, um, we really, you know, it'd be great to have pollinators all the way along our streets. Um, and uh, not only does it cut noise, but it also uh, reduces speeds. Um, if you've got uh, shrubbery uh, right along the, the curb. So uh, no, I'm very uh, supportive of that. Um, and already the city uh, encourages it. Um, uh, so I, I think it works hand in hand with the, uh, with uh, my motion. Uh, so uh, I'd support I'd support it. Thanks, Councillor Rima. Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Worship. Um, i fully supportive of it. You know, some of the things that come to mind are also how this could be a, a great way to incorporate a concept or some design areas to give residents um, an opportunity to engage um, as uh, a neighborhood with communities in bloom. So it could also become a local category that we want to align in our market through our communities in bloom committee and then help to look at incentivizing that with our little bloomers and other themes. Yeah, but it is great that this is something that builds currently on the city's current program, which is free. Um, you just have to register and there's great native uh, plants listed. So um, I just, I'll put a note out there. You don't have to wait for this either. Um, you can do that at any time for free by registering your boulevards. And this is an active program that could just be further leveraged. Thanks, Councilor Congo, Councilor Morales. I'll be supportive. This is amazing for all the aforementioned reasons. I just want to temper expectations. The, the kind of person, house, whatever, the kind of uh, uh, person that uh, lets the grass grow to the point where it's problematic is unlikely to be the same kind of person that's going to apply voluntarily to, yeah, yeah. I don't mean to be negative, but yeah, I see some smiles. You know what? This is a meeting of the art of the possible. So let's be optimistic, but let's quell expectations on this. I like the positive incentives instead of the negative incentives and 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 basically telling people that they should be cutting lawn that doesn't belong to them and penalizing it um but yeah i'm fully supportive of this and um let's 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 be realistic but let's be hopeful thanks council morales on the amendment any further comments i'm going to support it i walked by a couple of great ones in allendale heights there's one on meadowland there's another one on spring home they really are quite beautiful i think they're a positive addition to our streets in our city Councilor thompson did you want to Comment on this? Actually, Mayor Lehman, I would just uh, ask if uh, the mover of this amendment would just uh, separate them. I actually support this paragraph, but I don't support uh, number one. Ah, uh, uh, okay. We can vote on the two separately, uh, but we need to pass the amendment first. So, Madam Clerk, we can do that when the time comes. Um, yes, Mayor Lehman, you vote on the amendment first, and then you can separate paragraph. If it's in, we can vote on the paragraph separately. Okay, good. Um, so on the amendment, though, uh, members of the general committee, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the amendment for Boulevard Gardens? Any opposed? None. That carries unanimously. Thanks, Councillor Aylwin. Uh, next, I head to Councillor Kungle. Thank you, Worship. So I've got yeah, lots of questions around the first in concept would love more information about um, if our operations and other staff have recommendations for how to implement that or if they would consider that as an opportunity in suit with other municipalities. So very keen on getting the information. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll wait until that comes forward then because I do have lots of questions around application, accessibility, um, and then how this actually works for different resident situations. But happy to see the information come forward. Thank you, uh, Councillor Rima. Thanks, Councillor Congo. Councillor Natalie Harris. 
Yeah, I, I, I echo Councillor Kungel. I had some questions about accessibility and, and what that looks like, but um, yeah, it's coming back with information. So I support it because that's what we're at. Okay, uh, other comments? Councillor Harvey. Yeah, just a few questions for the mover, your worship. Uh, just curious, obviously it's a problem in your ward um, and I'm just not sure if the issues in ward one are similar to what I see in ward seven because the only boulevards that I've seen an issue on are on like major thoroughfares like Mapleview, for instance, where um, the current policy is expecting corner lots to cross the sidewalk at the side of their house. So they're not only mowing a strip of uh, grass at the edge of their property to the sidewalk, but they're also expected to cross the sidewalk uh, to, to mow that boulevard. So I was just wondering, is this the same issue and where do you plan on going with this? Because I think on, uh, on these major thoroughfares that uh, for the sake of another 40 feet when our staff were already there, that uh, we should be continuing to do these major thoroughfares. And it doesn't seem to be a problem uh, once you get into the, uh, the residential areas off the major thoroughfares uh, that I've seen anyway. Councillor Reedman, did you want to comment? Sure, um, and, and that's exactly the reason why I've put it forward to ask staff to uh, take a look at it because it may well be that uh, in commercial areas or in uh, residential areas abutting major roads and things like that, that uh, we wouldn't, uh, wouldn't do that. Um, but in uh, the residential areas where there's just a residential street, um, that there might be a basis for doing it. Um, and I, I think that there's, there's probably a, a lot of twists and turns on that. And I think that, um, you know, it would be great if staff would have a look at what other municipalities do um, and kind of line ourselves up with, with uh, what other, others do. Um, and that's why I'd, I'd like to see a report back and uh, then we can uh, make a decision. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm not gonna support it only for the reason is your timing. Uh, we're still in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, people have got a lot of other things and issues. Uh, from a financial perspective, uh, just trying to keep their houses going. So I don't think uh, right now is a good timing for this. And as a result, I won't support it right now. Next, Councillor Harvey, Councillor Thompson. Thank you, Mary Lehman. Through you to Ms. Banton, if she's on. Um, if it's property standards, uh, Ms. Oh, Banfield may be able Banfield. to answer. Yeah. yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Um, Ms. Banfield, would you be able to have a number of how many tickets for property standard were issued for not cutting their grass, not boulevards, their actual front lawns? Maybe Madam Clerk, I see you waving. Um, Mayor Lehman, three to Councillor Thompson. I actually have Jason Forgrave on the call and he may be able to assist with that response. Mr. Forgrave. You're still on mute on our end, Mr. Forgrave. There we go. That's gotcha. There. My apologies. Uh, through you, Council, um, Mayor Lehman to Councillor Thompson. There are no set fines under the property standards bylaw currently for any violations. Uh, we use administrative penalties, uh, administrative fees um, for orders and letters that are sent out, notices that are sent out. Um, and that happens repeatedly uh, week after week. Do you, do you have a number of how many are, uh, I know that you do your initial visit after a complaint and the homeowner has, I think it's 12 days to comply with the order. And then if not, then there's issued of um, a penalty. Do, do you have any kind of ballpark number of how many you've actually issued? Um, to the fullest after the 12 days where they haven't complied with the order. Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Thompson, I don't have any uh, exact numbers. Um, I do know that it is quite substantial. Um, there are lower fees for the first offense and then uh, higher fees for subsequent offenses. Um, would be happy to look at that information. Uh, right now, I, I would not even have a ballpark figure for you. My apologies. 
I need to apologize. Um, I, I should have reached out actually. And, um, another follow up to that: Would your staff say that if the front lawn is overgrown, the boulevard, or do you do you attend a lot of homes where the front lawn is um, well kept? and the boulevard is not because the homeowner feels that that's the responsibility of the city because that's their property? Or is it, as Council Morales said, the people who let their grass grow to over eight inches are probably not the same people who put a garden. Is it the whole property is probably um, not up to standards? Through you, Mayor Lehman to Councillor Thompson. Generally, that is what we find. Um, I do note that we receive uh, the odd complaint for uh, houses that have well manicured properties and have not uh, taken care of the boulevard. Unfortunately, we do not enact our property standards for that. Um, if we're on the property for another reason and find the boulevard staff will um, um, probably suggest uh, that that could be an issue. Uh, I know operations has um, had a program where they will request the uh, residents to assist with the tax base and, and with their workload by cutting the lawns, um, but we wouldn't enact anything there. Um, but to your initial question, yes, uh, majority of them are the entire property, Boulevard and private property. Perfect, thanks for that. Um, as much as I realize the intent of this, uh, I, I won't support the first part. Uh, the second part I'm a big fan of. And for the simple reason, we, we keep adding studies to staff. Um, the numbers, like probably 130 reports. So by the time we get this back, it'll probably be the snow of 2023 and nobody will be cutting the grass. So I just, I and another thing, I don't like to pass bylaws that pit neighbors over neighbors and uh, it doesn't make great community and you hope that people have the respect for neighborhoods but i just think constant bylaws that we have trouble enforcing uh really really important ones just on staffing levels of cars parked over sidewalk for the accessibility act and to to send them out for boulevards where they're already attending because as uh, mr forgrave said they're there already for the front lawn. So uh, that's my rationale for not uh, voting for this. Okay, thanks, Councillor Thompson. Uh, on the motion as amended, are there any further comments? Councillor Morales, then Councillor Kungle. I'll just ask you to keep your remarks brief. We do need to move along. Go ahead, Councillor Morales. Okay, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, pretty quick, I won't be supporting it. Um, I think charging people, penalizing people because they're not mowing the city of Barry's property is not the approach I want to take. Um, you know, I have a couple of residents on Maple View Drive that, you know, some of them are having, uh, you know, uh, uh, septic tank issues, connection issues. And I'm discovering all these technicalities where the city of Barrie won't pay for any piping or connection fees when it's on their, on the, on the, on residence property. And they literally go down to the centimeter. They'll pay for it. And then they won't, they follow property laws, <laughs> property boundaries. Yet, yet this amendment as presented has the expectation that, you know, um, when it benefits the city, please cut the lawn up that it belongs to the city or else we'll fine you. But when it benefits the resident, we're only going to do right up to the letter of the law and then stop. That doesn't seem fair. I get the reality of um, it, it might be unsightly. I also have concerns about liability. And it might seem like I'm, I'm grasping at, at straws here, but in those scenarios that Councilor Harvey described, and they come to mind, Essel Road, um, some other major uh, 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 streets like that, Burton Avenue and A, um, where there's a bit of a land and this corner unit and there, there might be a bit of a slope. If residents are not to maintain that, or maybe there's exemptions, um, what happens to the liability where a resident, either on those properties that I described or just any boulevard, they're cutting the lawn with a mechanical push one or even a ride along one, they've got their AirPods, they've got their noise canceling, headsets, and what if they injure themselves or they injure, I'm not gonna say a child, but most likely a pet. Let's say a small little dog just ran and got chewed up. And it, you know, it's, I'm not trying to be comical or, or, or fear monger, but where's the liability in that one? Because all of a sudden the city goes, 
well, you decided to cut our lawn. That's not, you know, sorry, you shouldn't have done that. And then the resident goes, well, you passed the bylaw that required me to do it. Otherwise I'd get ticketed. Now we're in a very murky legal ground. Um, and again, when you're asking people to do something and penalizing them, there's also, I guess, insurance or liability implications. I don't want that. Uh, and Mary Lee, if I can, I would actually do an amendment um, to get rid of the concerns that I have. And the amendment would read as follows. It would get rid of essentially Councillor Rima's original text. I would leave Councillor Alwyn's amendment because that's awesome. Uh, but I would essentially remove the original amendment and say that staff look into a adopt a, a boulevard program um, and, and, and report back to council on uh, the implement, uh, feasibility of implementing an adopt a boulevard program uh, and appropriate compensation. And I can speak to that amendment very briefly. Okay, we have an amendment from Councilor Morales to replace the text in paragraph one with uh, creating an adopt the boulevard program. Yep. And I'm sorry, the balance of your amendment, uh, Councilor Morales? And just the feasibility and report back to Council. Okay, uh, would you care to speak to that? Uh, yes, I, I, I am supportive of positive reinforcement, not negative reinforcement, specifically when it comes to residents having to do something that is to the letter of the law, not their property because when it comes to the letter of the law and other things, we are not extending that to other residents. Um, it's opt-in. So if you don't wanna opt-in, then so be it. But those really good residents that, that we're trying to capture, they can go on the website, they can opt in and adopt the highway, adopt the road, like following that kind of notion and they can adopt their boulevard. And now they're opt-in, uh, there's you know legal liability that is all waived because our staff would do a great job at, at, at making sure that's clear. Um, and once they're opted in, they take upon the responsibility of looking after the, the boulevard uh, that they've adopted. And um, again, th this will be staff's job, but an appropriate level of compensation um, uh, for doing so. And what I mean by that, it could be $20 a year. It could be 50. I mean, and it could be, uh, and for administrative ease, it could be on the water bill. It could be on the property tax bill, whatever staff recommends. And here's why I'm proposing uh, that there's also a financial component but notice how that wasn't in my amendment. If staff don't wanna address that one, then it's very generic. The reason is if somebody, I, I ping Barry all the time. When I see a boulevard um, and uh, Councilor Rima is right, they're usually in ward one, ward two, ward eight, sometimes in nine, um, I ping it, staff go and cut it. Uh, but that service request, um, you know, just, just estimating on, it's usually two or more employees, the truck and the work order uh, and the total amount of time and to get back to the operation center or not, it's probably a couple hundred dollars. And if they're doing that two or three times a year to be very, uh, to assume that it's not uh, as wet of a summer and spring and fall as we had this year, assuming they're doing it just three times a year, um, that's about 500 bucks, give or take. Um, so yeah, there is a cost to the taxpayer, but if there's some sort of incentive program with adopt a, a boulevard where it's 20 bucks, it's 50 bucks, it's just, you know, it's the equivalent of showing up to your neighbor and saying, here's, here's a beer. Thank you for helping me out with with uh, with something very small, I think it's reasonable, and if anything, it's cost, it's 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 revenue positive. It's incentivizing people uh, with 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 uh, with positive uh, uh, affirmation instead of uh, 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 the fear of punishment, and it um, I think it still achieves uh, the goal that we want. Okay, on the amendment to instead create and adopt the Boulevard program, uh, Councilor Jim Harris. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Um, interesting concept, uh, and, uh, I, and I like the intent. And what I would liken it to would be the uh, Snow Angel program that was done by citizens. So what I would say is this could be something that could happen uh, in our community through volunteerism. It wouldn't need to be funded by the city, organized by the city at all. So I would say great thinking, Council Morales, but let's let citizens sort this out like Snow Angels did and have some sort of a naturally occurring um, boulevard support that uh, could happen through our, our our residents and citizens and neighbors. So I would not support your motion, but I, but I appreciate the uh, intention. So thank you. Thanks, Councillor Harris. Councillor Kungo on the amendment. Thank you, Worship. And uh, from a process, please let me know if I need to hold till we're at the original, but I'm thinking of referring it to Finance Committee. Uh, if Council would be open to that, I'd love to have continued dialogue. Um, I was going to say city building, but because it does have implications, I'd love to explore um, discussion around where the boulevard um, 
consideration if we can have staff present on property standards overall around lawns, if that's what we're seeing, um, in addition to um, how do we look at incentivizing um, some programs, but I was wondering if a uh, referral to um, a reference committee could support staff bringing back some information and having a deeper dialogue. Um, so uh, I think we need to deal with the amendment on the floor and then I'll welcome your uh, referral amendment, uh, Councillor Kungle, if that's all right. Uh, Councillor Morales's amendment, uh, are there further comments on his proposal to change from uh, the printed motion to uh, staff investigating adoptable at large. Okay, Councilor Morales, quick last comment before I call the question. Quick last comment, Mayor Lehman. Uh, to Councilor Harris's point, great point. I don't think we'd have success as much as, as Snow Angels, and here's why. There's a psychology as to why Snow Angels has been successful, and that success is still incremental. There's a feel good component to helping out your elderly neighbor or your mobility challenged neighbor or the accessibility issues, or just that feeling of I did something good. Um, it's the same psychology towards uh, why charities, food banks, remember, they, if people want to donate the can, they want to put it in, they don't just want to click the e-transfer, or the button or whatever, it is not, and there's a whole like, uh, field of, 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 of psychology to that. Um, it, I'm not an expert in that, but I would suspect that if there's a reason why people don't already uh, well, we, we don't already have perfect boulevards. There might be the odd neighbor that does uh, do the boulevard for their uh, neighbor graciously, but the fact that, it, that it's an issue shows that uh, residents need a little bit more of an incentive and the uh, community, for that reason, the market hasn't responded to organizing it themselves. So um, I, I just wanna make it clear that there is kind of a psychology difference between shoveling a driveway, putting in a can to a donation and mowing a lo the lawn. Um, so I do think it would be beneficial um, um, to uh, have staff look into this and maybe they say, you know what, another organization is likely to pick it up or they can provide similar support um, that they did with uh, Snow Angels, even though they didn't do it all. They at least guided the process and marketed it. Um, and then if they come back to us and say, you know, we're not interested, we don't have the capacity, et cetera, then, uh, then so be it. But I'd rather explore those positive community building in, uh, ways of doing it uh, instead of uh, uh, penalties. Okay, uh, thanks, Councilor Morales. With that, I would like to call the question uh, on the amendment. Uh, I'm actually gonna vote against this, but I'm also gonna vote against the original paragraph one, so there you go. Um, and the simple reason is uh, this is not the priority that I think our staff should be spending their time on right now. Um, totally understand the concern from homeowners who have one person in their neighborhood who isn't doing it, uh, but I believe there are other solutions on a property by property basis. So I'm gonna oppose this as well as uh, the original paragraph one. And with that, I'll call the question on the amendment. Those in favor of the amendment, Councilor Morales has adopted a Boulevard amendment. Opposed. Okay, that amendment fails. We are now back on paragraph one as printed and paragraph two as approved uh, earlier, which was Councilor Owen's amendment on Boulevard Gardens. Any further comments? Uh, I know we're gonna vote on them separately. Uh, yes, go ahead, Councilor Natalie Harris. Oh yeah, you wanna, Go ahead. That's all, that's all I was just clarifying that we're voting separately. Sorry. Yeah, I will. Um, so uh, with that, I'll call the question uh, on paragraph one. Those in favor of paragraph one. Can I? Oh, sorry. Correct. Councillor Condon, did you have a question of procedure? Yes, thank you. A question of procedure. Could we refer this, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Finance? You had, yeah, you had indicated earlier. Sorry. So we'll consider the referral amendment first. So were you looking to refer both paragraphs or just one? Just one, I'd like to expand the conversation at Finance Committee to include lawns, not just boulevards, and uh, explore the more deeper dive around what we're seeing around response from a bylaw enforcement consideration. So it would be just one. Okay, so uh, a referral amendment to refer paragraph one. Uh, and sorry, Madam uh, Clerk, would it be finance and corporate or, or city building? I'm sorry, Mary Lehman. Um, it would be finance and corporate services since it's um, enforcement. Okay, thank you very much. So the referral motion is non-debatable and I'll call the question those in favor of referring paragraph one to finance and corporate services committee. Okay, that passes. So uh, finance and corporate can consider paragraph one at its next meeting. Paragraph two 
I will now call the question on those in favor of paragraph two. Good, any opposed? None, one abstention, that carries. Okay, uh, we'll move on. Next item held was item 8.5, correspondence from the Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit regarding a line of credit. Councillor Congo, you held this item. Yes, thank you, Your Worship. I held it just um, to provide some update and insight into the context of the request for the, the line of credit um, and to create an opportunity for any members of council who had any questions um, as a member of the Health Unit Board, uh, along with Councillor Gary Harvey, um, opportunities to kind of address any points of clarity. Um, so I'm happy to take questions, but uh, overall, again, I wanted to reiterate um, we really are looking at uh, a request up to the $5 million that would support the health unit, which is going not just to City of Barrie, but to all respective municipalities. So this would touch um, Simcoe County Council tomorrow. And then I believe um, this month or at the next uh, uh, meetings of council would uh, impact the district municipality of Muskoka and the city of Aurelia. So all four of us respectively are, are tabling the same motion. Um, that would need to pass and support. Um, this is really looking at managing a situation by which we have responded through our Simcoe Muskoka District Health Unit um, to incur costs in order to respond to COVID. I can talk to some of the specifics if there are questions, but this does deal with the actual costs around um, salaries and other items, uh, including benefits and expenses that have been incurred since January 1. Um, so this is really uh, ensuring that uh, health unit has what it needs um, from an operational standpoint to ensure that um, uh, we can continue. Um, some of you, if you read the documentation through the circulation list, would have seen that the government, so that would be the Ministry of Health, has identified some of the reimbursement of expenses incurred, but has not um, provided 100% of expenses to date. So there will be a process. I can speak to that if needed, um, but that will follow through. But at this time, uh, this really highlights the importance of ensuring that while we wait for that funding uh, as a health unit, that um, we do have access to a line of credit. That line of credit, although it's $5 million, I believe would only be um, used up to the amount needed, not necessarily the full $5 million, but that would be the amount that we would have access to as a health unit. So I'm using reference to we, but I am wearing my city of councillor hat, uh, so forgive me for that, but that is the context, I believe, from a health unit perspective of the ask. Okay, thanks very much, Councillor Kong. On the motions on the floor is printed, which is that we provide consent uh, to the health unit getting a line of credit. Uh, and that ask has gone to the county. It is being considered by Committee of the Whole tomorrow morning. Uh, and uh, as I understand it, to the district and to the city of Aurelia as well. Uh, comments or questions on the motion that's on the floor? Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman, and uh, I appreciate uh, Council Congo you uh, being um, proactive and forthcoming uh, and give you a little more insight. Um, what is the financial implication to the taxpayer of Barry? So I'm not sure I can speak to that directly. The, the major impact would be on the health unit uh, and their their operations, of course, right? So again, this is ensuring that um, there is access to funds while we wait for the reimbursement from the Ministry of Health around expenses uh, approved related to COVID. Um, so the cost of staffing up the immunization clinics. So uh, depending on the outcome of the four, I think then we would have to look at that as um, a risk impact that if there's expenses overall that I don't believe the health unit knows at this time, but you know we have they have not been given 100% approval of costs incurred to date. Um, assuming that all follow suit and all of those expenses are reimbursed, then none. Um, if there's a shortfall, then I think there would be identification by the health unit around whether or not we would need to look, whether or not they as a board would look to both City of Barrie and other municipalities around a levy. So how do they recuperate the costs um, if they don't have any revenues um, uh, to um, actually mitigate any deficits incurred by the immunization clinics and salaries and expenses? Uh, <clears throat> Council Congo, can I just ask you a really direct question and try to get a real direct answer back? 
What is the financial implications going to be to the city of Barrie? I don't know if that's known until we actually go through the process with the ministry and the board. So um, for instance, uh, in the documentation we have to date, um, the health unit requested $9.5 million and will receive just over 4.4 million. So that's what they have formally communicated to cover. There is a process health units will need to go through that the ministry has communicated to my understanding that will require documentation and um, looks like the health unit is awaiting approval from the ministry to flow December cost shared portion in August. So there is other details tied to this around the timeline of how the ministry will review and approve the rest of the expenses incurred. I don't think we will know that until the, at least the next couple of months. So that will be based on the ministry's communication to the health unit and the reporting required. Okay, I uh, appreciate uh, the answer. I'm gonna be asking, um, uh, Mr. Miller, through you, uh, Mayor Lehman, uh, you know, what maybe the financial implications he believes may occur, but maybe I'll give him a little, a little time to process that. Uh, maybe I'll ask you, Councillor um, um, Congo, through Mayor Lehman, um, refresh my memory on what the sense of urgency is here. So the health unit, as all health units started this process, so for the funding asked to recover costs related to COVID, um, currently totaling in the amount of $9.5 million has been incurred since January 1st. So the health unit has had to pay out payroll expenses and benefits back till January. They've yet to see the full reimbursement from the ministry for those expenses to operationalize COVID responses. What we have seen publicly announced by the Ministry of Health through the government is that of the $9.5 million of costs incurred, only 4.4 million has been approved for reimbursement to date. There is an expected process that will follow suit for the remaining amount of money, but there is nothing on record identifying when that funding will flow. Um, and so the line of credit is a proactive risk mitigation strategy to ensure the health unit operations and any continuance of COVID response, um, immunization response, is able to be supported. Um, so the line of credit would be a risk mitigation strategy to allow for that cash flow. <sighs> Council Congo, I'm, I'm just really looking for direct answers and I feel like I'm getting a whole bunch of detail that's really confusing uh, my decision to approve this today. Uh, so I'm just trying to be straight up with you. Give me, you're, you're, you're giving me way too much detail. I, I want to ask a real direct question is, what's the financial implication? You don't know. My next question would be, when do you believe you would know? And I'm guessing through your discussion, that's going to be maybe in two or three months. So, so I, I'm just uh, I'm just going to jump in here. Go ahead. There's no financial implication to the city of the health unit getting a line of credit. If they don't get their bill paid by the province for the work they're doing to lead the pandemic, they're gonna come back to the municipal partners and then there's sure as heck is a financial implication. So uh, I'll let Councillor Harvey though, provide a little more detail and give Councillor Kungla a break. Go ahead, Councillor Harvey. Thanks, Mayor Lehman. Uh, just trying to help out a little bit, maybe provide a, a little better clarity. Um, uh, really what it comes down to is obviously because of the health unit having to spearhead the local uh, immunize, mass immunization clinics. They've had to hire over 200 new staff on a temporary basis. As a result, obviously, uh, their staffing costs have ballooned significantly. Every other health unit in this province is in a similar situation. However, we're not privy to each individual's health unit's financial uh, situation at this present time. The situation that we find ourselves in is that we require the $5 million line of credit to be able to continue what we need to do through the pandemic to allow the, the health unit staff to be able to move forward and continue to offer the services that they have. And, and this effect has been solely as a result of the pandemic. 
what the end result is going to be. Nobody has that crystal ball because as Mayor Lehman mentioned, it really does come down to what the final decision of the Ministry of Health uh, is when it comes to the percentage that they will fund all of the COVID related uh, costs. Uh, all of the health units are have running two separated budgets, one that is solely COVID related. So that way the expenses are very clear and there's no confusion as to which uh, expenses are COVID related and not COVID related. Um, so this is a situation that uh, our board finds ourselves in and uh, there's no other way to get out of this temporarily uh, other than through a line of credit or coming to all the municipal partners and asking for significant funds right now. So this is the, uh, the an interim solution. And if the province uh, doesn't end up paying the entire bill, then yes, there could be uh, levy issues uh, for the next fiscal year when uh, when we're dealing with budget time. Well, I appreciate that, uh, Councillor Harvey. And um, I'm not sure how I feel about Mayor Lee when you directing, you know, uh, from Council Congo to Council Harvey, but I'll let that one go. He indicated uh, Councillor so McCann, I, and I'm chairing the meeting. Mayor Lehman. He indicated Councillor McCann, and I'm chairing the meeting. Go ahead. Uh, he wanted to speak. That's so, why I went to him. You finished, Marilyn? Now I am. Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Marilyn. Uh, so I am still not uh, totally clear here, and I'm not going to stop talking until I am totally clear. Uh, thank you very much, Marilyn. So maybe I'll just change directions a little bit and maybe talk to uh, Mr. Miller or maybe uh, Mr. Prouse. Uh, and maybe the question I have for is, what is the financial implication by passing this tonight, not passing something else down the road? Uh, when is the worst case and best case scenario that uh, this funding will appear? Uh, thirdly, I, I am not interested in signing a blank check or a check for $5 million uh, without knowing exactly where it's going to. Uh, and so if I could maybe get some clarity, I do appreciate you, uh, Council Harvey. I did have a discussion with you on this and I, and, uh, and you directed me to, you know, talk to uh, Council Congle tonight. Um, so maybe if uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, if you would please uh, ask Mr. Miller and Mr. Uh, Prose uh, to maybe give me a little more insight so I am clear. Mr. Miller, your turn. Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to uh, um, members of general committee. Um, so I guess the, the request uh, Councillor McCann, as, as, as has been indicated, is um, they're asking for permission to get a line of credit from the bank, which uh, up to $5 million. That doesn't necessarily mean they'll spend the $5 million to keep them operating, because at this point, uh, the province hasn't indicated how much they're going to give the, uh, the health unit to pay for the cost to date and the costs are, that are to come. So at this point, there's no impact to the municipality, um, but as uh, uh, Mayor Lehman ind indicated, if the province changes the formula or doesn't honor, um, decides that they're not gonna cover the costs, then uh, the health units I anticipate would come to the municipalities to ask for funding. But at this point, it's just strictly to keep them operating. Um, there's, there's no direct impact to us to date. And uh, Mr. Miller, uh, if the worst case, worst case scenario happens that the province decides not to fund, then there would be a $5 million. Uh, would that be spread throughout municipalities? Or would that be a direct hit to the city of Barrie? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, uh, to Councillor McCann. I, 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 I would assume that most likely it would be uh, come back to the municipalities, but I, I, I don't know all the details of the, of the financial, of the health units, but it would probably be safe to assume. Um, but hopefully that won't come to that case. And um, at this point, they, they need to pay their bills. They're not asking us to give them anything. They're just asking if they need to draw the money from the bank, uh, they have that option. And just so I'm, I'm clear here, Mr. Miller, uh, they can't get this loan without this letter from us? Through you, Marilyn, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. I don't know what their um, what their governance structure is. I assume that they need their board of directors to approve it. Um, so, they... so maybe I could refer back to you, Mayor Lehman, and go through uh, Council Harvey and Council Congo. Uh, why do you need this letter from the City of Barrie? Council Congo? 
Yeah, so uh, depending on the structure of different health units, um, it's my understanding, and I, I, I don't want to misrepresent the health unit board in any ways, but um, health units that are part of regional models are not able to access additional funding directly from the region and don't require a loan. Um, so tied to, I believe, the potential impact um, a levy might have, um, this is identifying a concern and issue, re respecting the structure that the Simcoe Muscova District Health Unit has with the region and ensuring that there is um, support there. So my understanding is that um, this is the appropriate financial process by which we would need approval from all four municipalities to proceed with this type of line of credit. Thank you, uh, Council Congo. Um, you know, I, I have a real issue with this because I'm not clear, right? And you're not clear and neither is our director of finance. Uh, no one seems to be clear here. And I think I heard Craig Miller say that that $5 million uh, we could be on the hook for and that may or may not be spread through municipalities. I kind of asked you what the, the urgency was and, and your answer to me, if, if I'm clear, was that they've been waiting since January to get paid, um, you know, and so that was the only urgency was they just been waiting long, you feel they've been waiting long enough and that's a long time not to get paid. Uh, if I'm, if, am I correct in that analogy or in that uh, processing? Well, the urgency is that they've incurred over $9 million of expenses to date. Uh, and we don't have reserves that would manage that type of cost without recovery. And we haven't seen funding until now for just a portion of it. So from uh, any type of cash flow opportunity, um, we have um, responded to ensuring that staff have been paid and benefits have taken care of and expenses due to COVID, but we haven't seen a full reimbursement. So that means we've pulled from reserves where possible. We have uh, used available dollars where appropriate. Um, what's happening now is, so the ministry through the public information on the circulation list and through the information provided has identified that less than half of the amount of expenses incurred from January to August. So now we're in, um, you know, forecasting forward. Um, um, that's what we're looking at. So we would need from a health unit impact funding to proceed to finish off the year and continue to pay staff responding to COVID tasks and immunization clinics. There is a process that the, so this is a process that the ministry is driving as a next step that then for any other money that's asked to pay for expenses, there will be a process in the fall. I don't believe we are aware as respective health units when the ministry will be identifying how they want health units to report expenses and how long it will take to get any further reimbursements. So a line of credit allows operating dollars, paying of expenses while we wait for the ministry process to happen around review and approval of the remaining expenses incurred for the clinic. Thank you once again for your detailed answer. Um, I'd like to refer this counselor, uh, you know, to at least get staff's perspective, right? There's too many open ends here. Unless I'm not actually understanding this clearly, which that could be the process, but we're in a really bizarre um, you know, uh, position tonight that we have no cooling off period. We're gonna vote on this right now. And then, and I hope, maybe pray to God that within an hour, we'll be at city council and then we'll be voting for this for final. And I'm still not convinced that we're not actually, um, um, uh, in, uh, locking us in to some type of financial uh, payout, right? And this is the province responsibility. I reached out to the MPs. They gave me different answers. Uh, so right now there's, there's you know, always three sides to every story. And now I'm hearing three different versions. And I want to hear my staff's, our staff's, um, you know, uh, perspective. Uh, and especially if there's $5 million that could be coming out of taxpayer money. So I'm not sure, uh, the reason why I'm asking about the urgency, uh, why can't we let staff take three weeks until we're back in, in uh, September of the very first meeting and, and uh, have a debate about this or discussion about this with actually these due process in place? Could you comment on that please, uh, Council Congo and Council Harvey? I can, I guess I would say that, um, there's a concern there. So for me, it's around making sure the health unit 
has access to cash flow. This is a line of credit that they are responsible for that supports them from a risk mitigation. Uh, we won't know the outcome until the ministry and the health unit uh, actually move through the funding review process. And then by the end of the year, understand what the government's actually going to recover. That will then inform any, if all, you know, any type of levy or deficit that the health unit would manage and that would be a board conversation decision. So I believe what we're faced with tonight is ensuring that we're okay with saying, go ahead and get a line of credit so you can immediately pay your bills while you're waiting for a provincial government process to ensue. I, I guess- maybe Councillor, you Councillor Harvey, you'd indicated. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I, I think it's important too to understand the situation, like, I mean, and this isn't something that just reared its head tonight. Um, this was discussed at our last board meeting. Uh, the document's been posted publicly uh, in our circulation list and to the public since the July the 22nd, um, which would have given anybody around this table ample opportunity to uh, explore any concerns that they may have opposed to us trying to satisfy those concerns on the fly tonight. Uh, we can only provide the information that we've been provided ourselves. Um, and, and that is the fact that the ministry thus far has only said that they are going to cover certain percentages and they are not at the normal 70-30 split uh, that we are accustomed to. Um, and that's where the huge shortfall is. And all of this COVID funding is additional costs that no health unit in this country had budgeted or planned for. And when all of a sudden your budgets are ballooning because of a pandemic, it's no wonder that we're, we're in the fiscal financial situation that we are because we still have the bills to pay, but we haven't been given the money from the higher levels of government. Until, until that cash starts flowing, this is the situation that we find ourselves in. And this is an interim fix to be able to continue being able to pay staff and to continue with these mass vaccination clinics as required, along with the many pop-ups that we see around our community that have started over the past month. And without that funding, all that'll have to stop. I, I don't know what else to say. I appreciate your, your, your detail as well, Council Harvey, but I, I guess maybe I'm just uh, not connecting the dots here. Why does this letter prevent you from doing that tomorrow? If we don't, if we were, if we refer this for three weeks, a month, right? What's stopping you from going to bank tomorrow and doing that? And I think the answer is nothing. Uh, I'm concerned that there's some liability attached that we're now on the hook for this. I'm not saying I'm going to vote no for it, but I'm just, I don't feel comfortable right now uh, signing over a $5 million check in theory, right? Uh, because potentially down the road, the, the provincial government is not going to pay the bill. Like, and then if they're going to get a loan and we're going to back them, well, how much pressure does that put on the province, right? Uh, I've talked to our MPPs and, uh, you know, they've got a different version uh, and I still haven't uh, got a detailed analysis from our experts, which is our staff, uh, and I still haven't found a good enough reason why referring this for three or four weeks to our very first meeting in September, right, uh, is going to change you getting a bank, uh, the Simcoe, uh, a Simcoe County getting a bank loan tomorrow through TD Canada Trust. So, so maybe you could give me some insight on that, please, uh, Councillor. Well, I can clarify that. So the health unit cannot get a line of credit without the consent of its funding municipalities, which includes the city of Barrie. Thank you. I, mean, I, did, I did ask that question about 10 minutes ago, just for clarification, guys. I mean, we could have saved 10 minutes if someone answered that. Um, okay, so you're saying that if we don't give this letter, they can't get the loan. It's, that's in their correspondence that's been out there for a couple of weeks, yes. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you. Okay, uh, members of council, I'm going to call a five minute recess. I've had a couple of requests for a bio break. It is after 10 o'clock. Uh, I have to urge us to be much more uh, brief with our remarks if we are to get through the remaining three or four items on the agenda. Um, so I'm going to call a recess at this point, but please turn your cameras back on if you could at 1010 so that we can reconvene. Thank you. Five minute recess.
Okay, folks, we're going to get started again. Okay, I will call the meeting back to order. Uh, the motion regarding a, uh, a correspondence to provide consent for the health unit to provide, uh, to get a line of credit from TD Commercial Bank uh, is on the floor. Uh, I do have quite a lengthy speakers list. Uh, Councillor McCann, uh, you still have the floor though. Oh, yeah, thank you, Mary Lehman, and I appreciate you coming back to me. Uh, I am not satisfied right now in voting in favor of this. I am definitely interested in hearing uh, my colleagues. Obviously, I'm not against supporting any relief, but I really believe we need to be educated, do our due diligence, and uh, the argument of waiting three or four weeks by getting staff some um, uh, insight. Uh, hey, we can not, I don't mind having a, a uh, an emergency meeting next week, but I think I need more than 45 seconds to uh, to process that we may be on the hook for $5 million. So um, I, I may put our referral motion forward, but I'd like to hear the rest of uh, council. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Deputy Mayor Ward. Yeah, I mean, the letter makes it really clear. And it says, in order to address the urgent need, the Board of Health is now following its borrowing policy based on the requirements of the Ontario Municipal Act, seeking written consent from the board's four obligated municipalities to borrow money in the form of a line of credit. We are not giving them any money. We are not going to be on the hook for any money. There's a chance that if the province, for some reason, said, no, no, we're going to repay you for all those expenses you run up, well, they're going to have to turn to somebody to repay them, and that'd be us. But I can guarantee across the province, There'd be such an outcry from municipalities if the province said it wasn't going to cover the pandemic costs. And I was on the health unit for many years. We had similar situations, not nearly that kind of expense, but there were extraordinary expenses for the SARS outbreak, for the um, HN, H1N1. And in all cases, the province came through and covered the costs fully at the end of the day. We are at no risk. Thanks. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Deputy Mayor Ward. Incredible uh, uh, explanation there, um, Miss Kung. Uh, sorry, Councillor Kungo, could you clarify for me um, the word "consent" uh, that's being in the motion? Is is that to be interpreted the same as co-signing? Because again, I've never seen such a short contract for a five million dollar loan in my life. I think that's where the concern stems from. I appreciate Deputy Mayor Ward's discussion, but consent. So consent. Um, is the approval of the support of one of the participating municipalities. That's fair, but is it co-signing? Is it collateral? Is it kind of like, you know, when someone needs a co-signer for a car or whatever, and, uh, you know, if, if they default, whatever, if, if you're next in line, is that the definition of the word consent? Because that's where my, I, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Councillor McCann, but that's where my alarm bell started to ring off when I saw the word consent. It was a, a two-liner or a three-liner for $5 million blank check. Is consent being interpreted by, through your motion? Uh, and Councillor Harvey's is it being interpreted the same as co-signing, even though we're being told that there's likely no material risk based on just how the provincial and these things work. So this is a municipal act uh, issue. So I'm just going to go to the Encyclopedia Municipalia, which is Don McAlpine. Um, Ms. McAlpine, could you just explain to general committee uh, when consent is required under the municipal act to allow a board uh, to go uh, seek a line of credit or something like that, uh, what exactly uh, it constitutes for the funding municipality. Mayor Lehman, thank you for the question. It is simply a resolution that the municipality will allow the board to seek the letter of credit. We're not acting as a co-signer. Thanks for that, Councilor Morales. Perfect. No, that's, that's incredible uh, clarification. And... Um, uh, Councillor Kungo, Councillor Harvey, do you know of any other municipality? So I'm assuming other municipalities are par uh, part of uh, the Simcoe Skilka District Health Unit have been 
uh, have the same request. Like it's been made of them or will be made at, at, at an upcoming meeting. Do we know if any of them have signed so far, like have said yes, if they've had early meetings or summer meetings? Um, yeah. I can speak to that, Your Worship. Go ahead. Um, so again, uh, all four, so us being one of them, received the same information um, and it's being tabled at their earliest meetings. So County Council Committee of the Whole is tomorrow. It is on the agenda. Um, we will likely see it if it's not published yet on the uh, agendas of the next uh, City of Aurelia and District Municipality of Muskoka, but it is urgent. Um, it is uh, a motion that is uh, proactively been put forward to ensure that it can get on the next available meeting. Okay. So we are first uh, of the four. Okay, perfect. And uh, if I can to Ms. McAlpin, Ms. McAlpin, I, 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 from what I'm hearing from Deputy Mayor Ward, it doesn't usually happen, province steps in, it's just how these things happen, but as a uh, with us giving consent, so if we're not a co-signer, if we're a, a, a participating person, who, a party that gave consent, and if say the province just said, nope, not happening, deal with it, go to your neighbor, uh, go to your participating municipalities and deal with it. And then at that point, the health unit goes, we can't make payments, we can't pay it out. And they approach us. Um, what would be the division of liability or yeah, the division of liability uh, or exposure on this line of credit uh, and how can we clarify that? So what I mean is $5 million, let's say they use up every penny, province says we want nothing to do with it. And then we, as city of Barrie goes, well, okay, this is unfortunate, but we have to deal with it, but there's no way we want to deal for the 5 million. And all the other municipalities, I'm not characterizing their intent. I'm describing a, imagine a figurative scenario. They go, well, you know what? Barry, we're just going to let Barry be the hero on this one. Uh, and then we go, no, 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 wait, wait, you got to come in proportionately. Um, how can we make sure we don't get stuck with 100% of the bill? And I bring this up because, it, you know, in lawsuits with municipalities, uh, people they tend to get stuck with 95% plus of the bill in liability cases, even though they might only be 1% at fault. We've all heard that phrase. So I'm wondering how we can limit the exposure of, of risk if things were to go sour or if we can even at all. I'm not sure if that's a question for Ms. McAlpine or Mr. Miller, but uh, we'll start with Ms. McAlpine. Mayor Lehman, thank you for the question. Essentially, the overriding legislation that establishes health units establishes the apportionment methodology. And the, the participating municipalities, in this case, the four municipalities, the county, Aurelia, the District of Muskoka, and the city of Barrie, have specified apportionment of uh, expenditures for the health unit that would apply in this case as well. Okay. That's, that's really good. Um, uh, and anyway, thank you, Mary Lehman. Um, I, I'll wait to hear the other comments of my colleagues. I, I guess the one thing I'll say to this one specifically as to this motion, um, and it's just my observations. And I'm, again, I'm coming from a place of hope. Um, I, I get this is tough. I get that nobody wished COVID, nobody missed, missed budgeted for COVID. Everybody's doing their best. We're supporting our first responders. I get that. But um, I, I understand uh, Councilman McCann's frustration um, when it's, it's, it's a $5 million ask, like a $5 million, almost not blank check, but you know, with limited information. All these details have been incredible, by the way. Thank you, Deputy Mayor Ward. Thank you, uh, Ms. Begaba. And thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, thank you to the, the, the councilors on the board. Uh, this level of detail, especially when, when we're here hitting asks where they hit uh, seven digits, seven figures, is 100% necessary. So um, again, it's, I, I, this is obviously a pattern now with uh, the, the kind of uh, discussion that we had in June uh, regarding uh, uh, Redwood. Um, so I, I think it's, it's, it's similar levels of, of, of details. And while it's frustrating, and I think uh, sometimes, uh, you know, personalities get involved and uh, other frustrations come to the surface, these are still necessary questions, uh, at least for my intent on voting. It's not about uh, withholding funds so people can provide frontline services. Um, obviously we all want the best, but it is definitely uh, for a level of accountability and exposure to risk for our taxpayers. So hopefully, I guess to end on a hopeful note, if for the next time that this happens, um, I will personally make sure to reach out with as many questions as I can, but even we've, saw, we've seen tonight, sometimes questions come up after another member of council has brought their great contributions to the discussion, questions that would have never been on our minds before. Um, but I think these questions are fair questions because th these are large amounts of money and um, I, I don't fault anybody for asking them. 
Uh, thanks, Councillor Morales. Uh, Councillor Thompson, did you indicate on this one? No. Nope. Uh, Councillor Jim Harris. Uh, no, I didn't indicate. Thanks, Mayor. Oh, my apologies. Okay. Uh, Councillor Congo, I know you did. Just a point of um, clarification in that although we we do reference the five million. So again, that's a line of credit amount. It doesn't necessarily mean all of it will be used, but it does provide a, a proactive approach to ensuring that they don't have to come back to the table for approval again, uh, and can ensure cash flow for expenditures if there's a del delay. We know the ministry has signaled a fall process, but we don't know what that looks like or how long it would take if uh, the annex flow of funding is to come. Um, so again, I just wanna make sure all are aware. I'm sure we'll get updates as we continue forward. Um, I do believe and encourage members of council to, to look at the information provided. Um, the finance team has been very proactive. Um, there's been lots of dialogue. I have no concerns with the operations of how the health unit has come forward with this uh, approach as a mitigation strategy. I actually applaud them uh, for taking this initiative to making sure that we, they continue to operate. Um, so happy to answer any, any other questions, but do hope that council uh, did have the opportunity to look through the information that's publicly facing that clarifies that we really are just dealing with the process of cash flow while we wait for ministry uh, funding approvals. Okay, thanks, Councilor Kungo. Uh, any other comments on this item? Councilor Harvey. Thank you, Worship. I think, too, it's important to note that uh, the executive management at the health unit did everything in their power with uh, reallocating their own staff, uh, closing down certain programs that obviously were uh, not a necessity and only those programs that were a necessity were continuing while the pandemic was uh, going through its process. And as a result, there was significant cost savings there. However, unfortunately, the board does find themselves in this position that that they're in now and uh, there's really no other way uh, to deal with this uh, in the interim you know, other than coming to the each member municipality and asking for cash right now which i think is more of a, an unrealistic possibility than uh, dealing with it uh, through a means of a line of credit so i would hope that all the members of council would support this thanks councillor harvey any other comments on the item okay uh councillor Raymond. Yeah, just very quickly, I'm 100% supportive. Uh, we've had 18 days to ask any questions we may have. I think this is a prudent uh, fiscal decision on behalf of the health unit. Thank you to our appointees for uh, working with us to explain the details of this. Um, I think we need to do everything we can to make sure the health unit has its resources during the pandemic. Thanks, Councillor Owen. Uh, any other comments on the item? Uh, I'll just echo those thanks to Councillor Kungel and Harvey for putting the item on, uh, for answering the questions tonight. Uh, the letter was received and distributed to Council on July 22nd, which was almost three weeks ago. And uh, I know in the interim, uh, the province has provided some financing. So let's be fair, they did pay part of the bill. Uh, but with $5 million outstanding since the end of February, I am not at all surprised that the board and our medical officer of health, especially during a global pandemic, would say we can't put any of this at risk. And there is great urgency uh, as far as I'm concerned uh, with the uh, vaccination clinic now requiring mobile clinics, new approaches. They're doing new efforts every day to try and vaccinate the last uh, portion of the population that um, will receive it uh, and still deal with the, uh, um, uh, the remaining public health measures as well. Uh, but the fact is these are for costs that were incurred prior to March uh, so it's pretty astonishing that uh, the province has uh, put the health unit in this position, and I, I trust they will resolve it. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, a line of credit. And I, I, last comment, I really appreciate that you didn't come to the municipalities and say, would you pay the bill in the meantime? And hopefully you can collect from the province. Uh, the health unit came and said, we would like your consent to handle this problem ourselves. And uh, we appreciate that. Uh, and I, I hope uh, it will be, the funding will be provided as soon as possible because uh, it, the last thing you do uh, when you're uh, pouring water on a fire is uh, count the cost of the water uh, coming out the end of the pipe. You use the water to put out the fire uh, and then we deal with uh, the implications of it. So thank you for bringing the item forward. Um, and I'll call the question. Are those in favor of the motion on the floor? Anyone opposed to the motion on the floor? Nobody opposed? 
Okay, that carries unanimously. Uh, we'll move on to item six, uh, sorry, 8.7, uh, which is Deputy Mayor Ward's item uh, regarding the water budget and uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, Councilor McCann, you held this item. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, maybe this question goes to um, Council or um, uh, Mr. Miller. Um, Mr. Miller, are we aware of what the 2022 water uh, rate would be? Sorry, Council McCann, you're, uh, did you ask the rate? Yes. Um, are you asking the average bill for the average homeowner or the amount? The rate's going to change next year. And I'm just basically, I, I'm going to ask, yeah, I'm, I'm asking if uh, Mr. Miller knows what the rate would be right now. Okay. Are you looking for the increase or the actual rate per? The increase. Okay. Uh, proposed increase next year, I think, uh, Mr. Miller. Any idea? Uh, through you, Mayor Lehman, to, uh, to members of the committee. Um, if you remember, the city did pass its uh, water wastewater financial plan back in May and June. I believe there was increases in there of, and I don't have them completely in front of me, but I think it was two and a half to three percent, I believe, for water and wastewater within that range. So, as you know, staff are working on the uh, um, the 2022 budget, and we'll be coming forward with uh, with the binder in November. But it's it's will be roughly close to a council's direction, which was tied to the long range financial plan. Great. Uh, I'd like to actually put a referral, uh, a referral notice up to the budget that we actually have this discussion uh, at budget time. Um, we're looking at uh, 2%, which I believe is somewhere in six figures. Uh, so I'm uh, proposing that as a, an amendment to um, this uh, discussion. So uh, you're wanting to defer this to the budget meeting? Councilor McCann? Refer it, refer it to budget meeting, yes. Um, if it's coming back to a council meeting, then it's deferring it to that future meeting. If you're referring it to another committee, that's a referral motion or back to staff. Uh, yeah, definitely want to but back to staff. Okay, so why don't I refer it back to staff? Uh, and I'd like to discuss this well, hardly uh, during budget, uh, not uh, summer break. Okay. Um, if you're referring it to staff, what, what would you want them to do with it? Well, I'd like to, well, there's a slew of questions that I have on, uh -huh. you know, that, that I have quite frankly, uh, and I think they would come back and, you know, where's the hundred thousand dollars going? Uh, you know, I've got a few other issues with this uh, amendment. I think it's, uh, I applaud Councillor uh, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, I think it's a great initiative. Uh, I just uh, want to see exactly where that investment of taxpayer dollars uh, would actually have, what impact that would have uh, on the community. Okay. Um, so are you referring it to staff to get a report? Um, and if so, I guess, uh, I think some direction, our staff often want the direction as to what, uh, what they should be reporting on. Yeah. Okay. So uh, in there for a motion, I would look at, uh, you know, what I have to, to reverse engineer this, you know, I, we've got a hundred thousand dollars taxpayer dollars. We want to get out of the, uh, the wastewater bill. Uh, I'd like to know exactly what impact that's going to have on that community. Uh, what communities it's going to go to. Um, and uh, I think we can do better quite frankly, right? Uh, I'm actually into this. I like to be supportive of this, uh, but I'd like to refer it, get more information from staff and, uh, and make a whole other decision and uh, come up with a, uh, a more thorough plan. Okay, uh, a referral motion is non-debatable. Would you be willing to let the mover speak to it before you introduce that motion, Councilman McCann? Certainly. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, sure, Th thank you for that opportunity, Councilman McCann. I'd just like to say that one of the problems with what you're proposing is that the motion tonight is to say we're gonna allocate the money and then hear possible uses from it from groups. And I think if we refer it all to budget we will not be able to hear from those groups between now and budget time and that's that'll be a lost opportunity but maybe i just speak to it generally and give me some leeway here um so truth and reconciliation and i know it's been a lot of definitions of what it is but for me truth is looking back telling the truth about history telling the truth about how canada has treated its indigenous population and it's not a nice story but it's one that is true and we have to tell it 
and it makes you very depressed. But reconciliation is about looking ahead, and that gives me lots of hope. And reconciliation is all about the future. It's all about earning the trust and respect between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous people, working ahead, finding ways to work together for a better future. For, you know, we, we know the past has been terrible, but let's find ways to work together. So municipalities across the country have been trying to find ways. What can we do to reconcile? What can we do as a symbol, as something we can do to show that we care? Um, you know, we've had, we've, municipal councils have set up advisory committees. They've been, they set up a staff position. They've uh, erected public art. They've put up symbols with uh, Cree symbols in some communities. They've done all kinds of things. And we've, in Barrie, we've done the land acknowledgement. We've actually, uh, tonight, we've, uh, we've recommended other steps we can take. But I wanted to do something more. I thought there, there must be something more we can do, something really practical. I'd like to do more. And about 10 years ago, when the new surface water treatment plant opened, we had a tour of the plant. And when I was walking through it, there's a wall in there that's about 10 feet high and about 50 feet long. It's massive. And it's covered with certificates of the people who work there, their qualifications, their degrees, their certificates from colleges. And I remember looking at it and thinking, this is the problem. You know, it's not building the plants it's finding people to run them it takes an incredible bunch to run these plants and i've always remembered that and so then when i became aware there was a group out there that was going to train take people take young indigenous men and women from their communities train them cost about a hundred thousand dollars by coincidence to train those people and then they go back they train them on small systems that they're going to be operating that they go back to their communities and they have a job and they work on them and the community has better water because of it and it's such a simple solution and i thought why can't Barry do it as a one-off? Here's something, all the other things we were doing in reconciliation, great. But here's a really a good faith symbol. I mean, we're so lucky in Barry. We turn on a tap of water and we can drink out of it. 40% of Ontario First Nations can't do that. 40% have to boil the water before they can drink it. And I thought, here's a great chance to make a bit of a difference on those communities. It's just that it's a gesture. It's not going to solve the problem. It's not going to build any plants, but it's going to go a little ways. And every time a Barry resident uses their water, they can say, I'm doing a bit for my part, my bit towards reconciliation. Maybe it's, maybe it's been optimistic, but I think there's real value in using part of our water bill. It's $1.77 per very resident. It would work out too, not per very resident, per household. It's a small amount. I want to point out municipalities have been doing this kind of thing for years, not giving money for this. This is rather, maybe this is a unique way of doing it, but almost every, every few months I read a story about a municipality donating a fire truck or an ambulance to a First Nation. It's exactly the same thing. A, fire, a used fire truck, they give them fully equipped and they make sure they're running well. They give them, it's about $100,000. And that municipality could probably sell that and say, yeah, we should, for the good of our taxpayers, we should sell that fire truck and use the money to put, in, put into other things. No, they they're sort of realize the need. There's an incredible need for fire trucks on First Nation pumpers. And so they donate them. And we're doing the same thing here. We're going to make a one-time donation. I'd love to see other municipalities do it. It'd make a real difference. I know I've talked to some counselors, they want to do other things and consult and, and we put so much work on staff. This is really clean and I mean, pardon the pun, but we don't want to muddy the waters by doing a bunch of other things. We don't want to, we don't want to take control of how that money is going to be spent. We want to find somebody running a program that we believe in, give them the money. And that's why I've invited Water First. It doesn't mean we're going to give the money to Water First, but it'll show you the kind of group that's out there that's already working in First Nations. And I don't want to get it complicated. I don't want to start consulting with people and having staff go out and find other projects. Let's just keep it really simple. We're going to do all those things as well. And if any other counselor wants to bring forward a motion to say, here's, here's something else we can do for reconciliation. I'll be all ears. This is just one proposal that's really clean and simple. 0.2%, $1.77 per household, and it'll make a big difference or it's got a potential to make a big difference. Let's not complicate it by trying to think of other things we can do. This is the water rate. I think it really should go towards a water project. We shouldn't, you know, things like youth in sports, uh, indigenous youth in sports are very important. If we want to bring something forward in that, great. But let's not use the water rate for that. Let's use the water rate to help other people get the kind of water quality that we have in Barry. So thank you very much for the opportunity to outline why I brought this forward. Thanks. Thanks, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, Councilor McCann, did you want to proceed with your referral amendment? Uh, yes, I do, please. Okay, uh, so just give us the amendment. So uh, refer back to uh, staff to come back with a full report. I'm giving a detailed synopsis of where the $100,000 will be spent, what community will be spent in, 
uh, and the impact that that hundred thousand dollars will have, uh, and um, and like discuss this at budget, and have the report back by budget time. Okay, members of general committee, so that's a referral motion to staff. Uh, I will call the question as it's not debatable. Those in favor of referring the item to staff and opposed. I'm opposed as well. That fails. Uh, Councilor McCann, you still have the floor. Yeah, I've got uh, quite a bit to say on this issue. Um, so maybe I'll let other councillors uh, have a go at it and I'll uh, go just before you, Marilyn. Okay. Uh, others wish to comment on the motion. Councillor Congle. Thank you, Your Worship. And um, sorry, I'm just before you start, Councillor Congle, um, someone's notifications are uh, beeping through into the meeting. So if you can just turn the sound off on your phones, folks, that would be great. Go ahead, Councillor Congle. Um, so it's a completely aligned at heart with um, Deputy Mayor Ward's motion and direction. Um, for me, where um, if I was wearing a good for, you know, uh, wearing a hat of a global citizen, I, I love this approach. I'm struggling with being able to share with residents, um, you know, answering questions about um, how is this potentially supporting um, us in Barrie and or in Simcoe County with, with individuals. Um, so I don't want to bamboozle the, in, the intention of it. And I, and, and Dr. Newmore Ward, you were very clear with that. And it's always inspiring to hear, hear you. I'm, I'm aligned, but I am struggling with, um, the, um, direction of the money to out of region, uh, and being able to answer that question without also knowing how do, uh, our local, uh, indigenous representatives feel about this? Is this something they would endorse or would they say, you know what, it would have been great if you kind of redirected that money into something locally. So I did want to propose um, um, potentially um, separating the items and actually referring um, part two, which is a presentation to finance, because it would be lovely to hear the presentation and understand more about the program before I'm prepared to commit uh, funding to it. Um, I do love the concept of dedicated dollars to support um, actions, um, but at a local level at this point in time, I am struggling with um, the redirection of dollars uh, out of region uh, and would like some more information about that. Um, so my interest is in separating the items and tabling um, a referral of the um, item to the presentation to still continue to finance committee at the next meeting. But I guess it would be uh, to be clear, an amendment to remove item number one uh, and continue with item number two. Okay, so that's an amendment, Councillor Congle? Yes, thank you. Okay, amendments on the floor to, to delete paragraph one on the amendment. Comments? Councillor Harvey. Thank you, Your Worship. I, I do agree with Councillor Congle. Uh, like, I mean, Water First is a very well known and reputable. Uh, not-for-profit charity that is nationally recognized with some uh, pretty big names involved in the organization. Um, however, I think before we go uh, dedicating a certain amount of funds towards uh, their initiative, it would be nice to uh, hear exactly where this uh, money will be going. And it'll also provide some time for uh, input as Councillor Congo mentioned from uh, some of our local First Nation representatives uh, to see if they are aligned with this direction also uh, before we make a final decision from a financial perspective. Okay, thanks Councillor Harvey. Uh, others wish to comment on the amendment? Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. Councillor Kungle, how is this different than what Councillor McCann moved earlier? I know one was to refer to staff for a fleshed out report, memo, whatever you want to call it. And this one is for it to go to the committee, which is made up of council members with staff there. You know, they're there for uh, uh, support, I guess. But what, what, what was the difference on that one? Um, it's actually... This Sorry, oh. this amendment's just for paragraph one, if I understood correctly, right, Councillor Conner? Yeah, removing paragraph one and continuing with paragraph two, which is the formal presentation coming to finance committee of um, that 
group to talk a bit about the program. I would be great to have that forum where staff uh, and that presentation could happen um, because I do believe the information would be resting with that organization. And sorry, so, just to be clear, this amendment is to delete paragraph one. Is that correct, Councilor? It is. Okay. Yeah. So it's not referring it, it's to delete paragraph one. To delete it. And, and through you, Mary Lima, to Councilor Kungel, again, same concerns as not concerns, same question as Mary Lima, is to delete it. And is, are we adding it back later after we refer uh, paragraph two, or are we just kind of leaving it at paragraph two and then we'll see what happens with the deleted paragraph one if it's reintroduced to finance? Is that the intent or are you just going to add it back once we refer it? Because I am also somewhat confused. No, it's simply removing it. And so it'll be left to, I think, the decision of finance committee if they want to frame a motion around a next step and then have further dialogue around if there's funding, where that comes from and how is it targeted or not. Um, so the intention really is to ensure that representatives um, do provide a formal presentation and we can have discussion with staff uh, at, a, at a public forum. Perfect, no money tonight. Thank you, Councillor Kongo. Thanks, Councillor Morales. Uh, Councillor Aylwin. Uh, Mary Lee, I don't think I've indicated yet. Oh, I might speak okay. to it later. But... Uh, Councillor McCann. Yeah, thank you, Mary Lehman. And uh, in short, I can totally get behind this Council Kungal. Uh, I think that's uh, a good fiscal responsible uh, decision. And I look forward to being at finance and uh, maybe asking a few questions myself. Thank you. Thanks, Council McCann. Uh, Deputy Mayor Ward. Uh, thank you. And it just for clarity, I think I've got my clarity from um, Councillor Kungal. So at that finance committee, we can introduce a motion to bring in paragraph one. And, and I don't have any objections to that. I mean, we're talking about the 2022 budget, so we're a ways off. I guess I wanted to sort of find out if there were other groups out there that might come forward and say, we're, we'd be better for that, that money. And that's why I wanted to establish how much money we were gonna get and then see how the groups came forward. I know there's one group, Water First, but there might be other groups and that's my problem. We're only gonna hear from Water First at that meeting. And I kind of wanted, I wanted to do it the other way. I wanted to put the, how much, we had some money out there. Let's hear from community groups, how they could, how they could put best, put it to use in improving water conditions on First Nations. If we want to do it this way, it's fine, but we're really narrowing it down to water first is going to be the only group we're going to hear from unless other groups come forward in the next, I'm not sure what, can somebody tell me when the next finance committee meeting is? Ms. Cook. Um, through you, Mayor Lehman, to Deputy Mayor Ward, it is September 14th. Okay, um, I, I can live with this amendment. I, I, I prefer to establish the amount first, but if the majority of council wants to hear from a group as to how they would spend the money, then I'm fine with that. Okay, on the amendment next, I have Councillor Harris. Me? Natalie Harris, yes. Uh uh, thanks. Through you. Um, yeah, I was just thinking, uh, I'm happy that Deputy Mayor Ward is okay with the amendment to remove number one right now, but then after the finance uh, meeting going forward, maybe we just putting it out there as a suggestion um, can add to number one if it comes back that we put a call out to other possible organizations in conversation and then we can have that full conversation afterwards but I'm in support of what um, Councillor Kongo has brought forward as well it doesn't take number one off the table forever um, and we can bring it back at another time but yeah it's a great discussion okay uh, thanks Councillor Harris uh, any others wish to comment on the amendment that's on the floor Councillor Reepma Thank you. Um, I'm in support of the amendment. I, um, I think that it's a great idea to have some further discussion. I would prefer actually that we have some contact with our local indigenous community so that um, they can uh, sort of give some thought to um, what we might spend this money on and how it be spent. Um, I think uh, Deputy Mayor Ward's suggestion uh, is a great one on water, but I'd be really interested to see if, if you know, some of our local uh, groups ha would have a different idea or a better idea. And I would, I, I think that might be something that we also should consider at the, um, at, at the finance uh, committee. Okay, uh, thanks Councillor Reba. Are there any other comments on the amendment? Councillor Owen. 
Uh, I was uh, not going to support this amendment, but uh, since Deputy Mayor Ward seems to support it, then I will go with that. I, I liked the idea of committing the funding, um, but if this is the will of council, so be it. Thanks for that, Councillor Owen. Any others wish to comment on the amendment? Seeing none, I will call the question. Those in favor of Councillor Kungle's amendment to delete paragraph one? Any opposed? None. That carries on the motion as amended. Any further comment? Okay, I will call the question. I'll just, uh, sorry, just before I do the comment I wanted to make was thank you, Deputy Mayor Ward, for bringing it forward. Uh, your active engagement on the file, the fact that you thought of clean water, which is without question one of the most pressing and embarrassing issues, uh, I think, as a Canadian and the most pressing issue for many Ontario uh, uh, First Nations communities. Um, I, I really like the tie-in, and I, I, you know, notwithstanding you, the funding commitment might come later or might not, uh, water services is something we are very proud of in the city of Barrie, and I believe it is an area where municipalities can help uh, Indigenous communities. So I'll call the question. Those in favor of the remaining paragraph, paragraph two. Anybody opposed? None. That carries. Okay, uh, we have one more public item. We have two in-camera items, and then we do have a couple of uh, folks from the community who have been incredibly patient waiting for to make deputations at our council meeting, which will start about 10 minutes after we complete the in-camera items. So with that, I'll just ask uh, if we can try and move quickly through the last item, and I will need a motion to extend in about 15 minutes to go after 11. Uh, the remaining item that was held, public item, is the individual or single tree bylaw. Council McCann, you held this. Was put on by Councillor Harris. Go ahead, Councillor McCann. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. And uh, you know, I uh, just want to maybe ask uh, maybe staff. You know, we obviously had a tornado uh, that ripped through the southeast end of Barry, and a lot of our trees were were down. This isn't directly related to uh, Councillor Jim Harris's uh, amendment, but maybe I can tie it in. Uh, is, is Dave Priory on, on vacation, or is he, is he available tonight? Oh, you are, sir, Dave. Thanks. To, to you, Mayor Lehman, could I ask maybe Mr. Ferrari uh, when he plans on uh, replenishing the trees uh, in the southeast end of Barry that were directly affected by the tornado? Sure. Oh, and uh, I'll just ask you to keep further questions on the tornado for inquiries, which we will do at council. Uh, but on the bylaw, which is on the floor, um, I will ask Dave uh, if he can answer that question since it's been asked. Sure, sure. A little more clear, Mayor. Are you asking yeah. me not to discuss this or I'm not following you? Yeah, you have the opportunity during inquiries because the motion that uh, is on the floor is about the single tree bylaw. This is directly related to single trees. Okay. Um, go ahead. Uh, but sorry, you're asking about when we're replacing the tornado trees, right, Councilor McCann? Correct, Mayor Lehman. Okay. Mr. Ferrari, go ahead and answer that question. Your Worship and members of committee, um, we have trees that are planted uh, early spring and typically late fall, and, and it's quite an extensive list uh, year per year. People will realize and, and get to know that it usually takes um, six months a year to, to get a tree once you're on the list. So uh, what we have to do is uh, we'll take the inventory, uh, we'll do an assessment. It could be a year or so before we, uh, we get around to replacing all the trees, um, but uh, hopefully um, you know, we can get them done ASAP. And uh, if you don't mind, maybe uh, Mayor Lee might do a little free freestyle with uh, Mr. Ferrari just to see if this is the, the appropriate time to ask council's uh, decision uh, on on um, my maybe amendment. But uh, Mr. Ferrari, uh, is that okay, Mayor Lehman? As long as it's on the item that's on the floor, go ahead, Council McCann. Thank you, Mayor Lehman. Uh, and so, Mr. Ferrari, you've obviously been in many conversations about the uh, the tornado with uh, residents. Um, you know, losing their trees. And there's been some, you know, some, some cases where uh, residents have lost their single tree at their house and it hasn't really been, uh, um, let's say broken, but it's been bent over. And so I've done quite a bit of research with uh, tree experts. And once a tree bends over, it's pretty much gone. Uh, residents don't understand that, why we came up and we, we cut them. And so, I mean, I wanna put up an item discussion uh, sometime this year that every tree that we replace, that we actually replace it, um, you know, with an eight, you know, inch diameter. But the specialist that I've been talking to says, Mike, that's impossible. You need like a, 
a 20 foot diameter. So he said that you could probably get away with uh, something like, you know, three to four inches in diameter because of all the lines and all the, uh, all the infrastructure below. So would tonight be the most appropriate time for me to have that? And I guess it's about timing. Or if I came with an amendment in September, October, would that give the residents and you enough time for us to come up with a, with a, with a wholesome um, discussion, uh, change the bylaw that the tornado victims would actually get like the biggest tree. And the reason why I bring this up, because that would be a significant dollar amount uh, extra. So is tonight the night, uh, Mr. Ferrari, or do, do I have time to bring this up in, um, in maybe September, October? Your Worship and members of the committee, we would have time. Uh, any of those tornado trees would not be planted this fall anyway. So we would have time to, to discuss that. Um, we do offer a, a program where people can sort of pay to get a little bit larger tree. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can have that discussion and, uh, you know, I can get you the exact uh, dimensions of, of the trees that we can offer. Thank you very much. Thank you much for your time, Mayor Lehman. Uh, okay, so did you put the item on the floor as printed, Councillor McCann? Put the item on the floor as printed. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is about uh, trees damaged in construction and excavation projects. Uh, and uh, it was put on by Councillor Jim Harris. Are there any comments or questions on the item? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Oh, sorry, no, nope. I saw a number of hands. Councillor Kungold and Councillor Morales and Councillor Jim Harris. Just to be real quick, because I know we've got, well, we're on the item, um, very happy to see this go forward and wondering, um, Councillor Harris, if you can share the information you have to date about when this will be coming back. I know many people are eager about seeing this. Uh, well, there is no time frame indicated in your motion. While we're, we've got the item on the floor, I was wondering if you could share when we might um, publicly know when this is coming back. Uh, thank you, Councillor Collins, for the question. Uh, and maybe, um, Mary Lehman, if I can um, um, ask Ms. Miller, um, and she's been uh, quite supportive in, in uh, this situation. So I know there's some tie-ins to some of the work that staff are doing. So it would be fair to ask Ms. Miller about time frame on that. Thank you for you, Ms. Miller. Ms. Miller. To you, Mayor Lehman, to Councillor Harris, certainly staff will work to get this back to you as soon as possible. We certainly are looking at a couple of different tie-ins to the affordable housing uh, report that is coming in September, um, particularly as it relates to the detached accessory dwelling units, which um, has been an, an, an area of uh, specific concern. So I don't have a, a specific a time frame, but if we can't do it in conjunction with the report that is coming uh, in September, we will have it to you as soon as we can. Thank you, Ms. Miller. That answer, that's good enough, Councillor Congo. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Congo. Councillor Morales. Uh, thank you, Mayor Lehman. So, uh, question, comments. So, my comments. I was going to say, and I know we. Uh, uh, she's been waiting patiently. I wanted to thank uh, Miss Colbatch. Uh, I had like hour, multiple hour discussion with her on Friday regarding uh, trees and some of the things that Councillor Harris's uh, discussion will address, and probably some things outside of the scope. I'll be supporting Councillor Harris's. Um, uh, item for discussion. I think boundary trees that are on not the applicant's uh, uh, property, but on neighbors' applicants need to be uh, protected as, and their root systems. And, uh, you know, there needs to be that cost analysis of the benefit of, of basically doing that extra little bit of homework instead of, oops, we killed the root system and it's gone, without a doubt. Personally speaking, trees that are boundary trees, but technically on the applicant's property, even if it's leaning in, even if the, the, the root system kind of went underground for me, and I'm sure we're going to have a time to have that discussion. For me, that's a different story. Um, however, I think the other cautionary uh, thing to say that once this comes back to us is when we do a cost benefit analysis as per the end of the discussion, maybe staff might assign a value saying if you take X number of trees out, you either plant them or you just have to pay some sort of fee uh, for towards a park fund or uh, tree reestablishment or something. Let's we we just need to again with a grain of salt acknowledge that that's an added cost. Uh, we want more intensification. We want more supply of units, affordable housing, attainable housing, social housing, housing period. Um, and let's aim to find that delicate balance between preserving trees that are capable of being preserved and are worth of being preserved and assigning a value to such an intangible, uh, important 
aspect of our environment, but also realizing that um, you know, we, we, we talk and we say we want more units and we want, want more of this and this might be a cost that might be sensible, um, but could have implications in terms of um, encouraging um, uh, infill development uh, for affordable housing, social housing, or just seniors housing, etc. So uh, I'll be in voting favor of it and I'll, uh, with a fine tooth comb, be looking at the report we get back. Okay, uh, thanks Councilor Morales. Uh, any further comments? Okay, seeing none, I'll call the question. Those in favor of the motion on the floor? Are any opposed? None. That carries. Uh, thank you, members of the general committee. That completes the items that were held. Uh, we do have two in-camera items. So, uh, and we will do inquiries and announcements at uh, council. Uh, so just before we go into the uh, closed session for those two motions, um, I need uh, circulation list items. Uh, any that members of general committee want to refer. So we'll start uh, June 30th. Anybody wish to refer any items from the June 30th list? Seeing none, July 8th. Seeing none, uh, July 15th. How about July 22nd? Okay, July 29th. And finally tonight's August 9th circulation list. None of them, okay. Uh, then that brings us to the end of the open session. Can I have a motion to move into closed session? Really, man, do we need a motion to extend first? Oh, sorry. Thank you for that, Deputy Mayor Ward. Not uh, that I would have in favor, but just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Uh, I will uh, ask for that though, because it is ten fifty-six. Somebody want to move that we extend the meeting past eleven? Councillor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Congle. All those in favor of extending past eleven o'clock? Anybody opposed? None with one abstention, that carries. Uh, we will move into closed session. Can I, if I could have a motion for that, please. Councillor Natalie Harris, seconded by Councillor Jim Harris. All those in favor of moving into a closed session to discuss uh, these are the appointment matters and the application to host the prior. Uh, all of those in favor, yes. Any opposed? None, even though I know some of you want to oppose it. Uh, okay. Uh, we will go into closed session uh, and we'll just take uh, two minutes to clear off there, but please don't anybody go anywhere. Uh, we'll just, we'll move into closed session now. For those watching the public, we will be back for city council when we are completed these in-camera items. Go ahead.